Good morning. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome everybody to this online workshop, which is concentrated on discussing issues around electrolyzers. Uh, electrolysis. So most particularly, this one is called Scaling Up Electrolysis Technologies for Electrolytic Hydrogen Production, as you know. So you've all signed up for it, so you know what we're doing here today. But before we actually begin with the first session, and believe me, I don't like to delay those things very much. At the most, we're going to be spending here a couple of minutes explaining the basics so that you understand how it's going to be working today. Uh, today is going to be quite a long Right. online session is going to go for about three hours and we're going to cover a variety of topics starting with first markets so as you can see there on the screen session one is going to be about global electrolytic if you go back please for me <laughs> okay so the first session is going to be about markets and we're going to be talking about global electrolysis capacity the second session is actually going to be talking to the technologists themselves and we're going to be going through uh, the different companies uh, and, you know, what are they working on at the moment? What is the availability? What is the sort of the, the price? What do they hope the, the time delivery milestones and so on and so forth? The third session, we're going to be talking about R&D and future technologies that are on the, currently being researched. And the last session is going to be on bankability and financing. Okay. So, first of all, I'd just like to, once that you understand the structures, introduce myself. My name is Belen Gallego, and I work for ATA Insights. We are the organizers of the RENMAD events, and we're going to have a RENMAD USA event in Las Vegas in July, which I invite you all to join. But today I'm going to be uh, privileged enough to be able to talk to all these experts about all of these issues in the electrolysis um, industry. So. First, what I'd like to do is for you to meet the experts that are going to be talking in the first panel, so that you can get to know them a little better if you don't already. So, Pablo, please, if you could introduce yourself for the people in the audience. Yes, with pleasure. Thank you, Belen. So, uh, my name is Pablo Ralon. I work at IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency. Um, I'm part of the team looking at the trends, uh, global trends in renewable energy costs, and also for what we call at Arena the enabling technologies, such as uh, electrolyzers for hydrogen production and electricity storage, among other stuff as heat as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo, and welcome to this webinar. Next, Peter, please, if you could introduce yourself. Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Marin. I am a uh, senior research analyst with Guidehouse Insights. Um, I lead our our low carbon technology and fuels division. Um, so hydrogen is our primary focus, but my group also looks at uh, other alternative fuels, including biofuels, e-fuels, ammonia, and some decarbonization solutions like um, CCUS. Um, I came to Guidehouse about two years ago uh, after about 20 years of business journalism as, as a reporter and editor covering the energy markets, uh, most recently with S&P. Um, <clears throat> in that capacity, I, I covered all facets of the energy market from oil and gas to, you know, carbon emissions credits and, um, you know, you name it. Um, but I just want to say thank you to uh, ATA and uh, to my fellow panelists and, and to the viewers um, for, for joining. Thank you very much and welcome, uh, Peter. And I'm looking forward to, to working with you also on other things because we'll definitely be following it up with e-fuels and other bits and bobs. So Pedro, uh, next, if you could introduce yourself. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Pedro Raposo and I am representing AFI. I'm working as a director part to X, uh, chemical engineer with a background on hydrogen for over 15 years, uh, where I've been involved as different roles from everything from uh, R&D project management up to uh, a development of proof of concept studies within uh, green steel and e-fuels. So I'm really happy and looking forward to, to this workshop. Okay, so thank you very much. So today we are actually focusing, as I said, on the electrolyzer. You know, we do a lot of these webinars and workshops, so you're welcome to attend them all. They freeze with them, and you can learn a lot of insights into this industry. But today, the electro the, the electrolyzer is our focus. So the way that we're going to be doing it is first you're going to get three presentations from Pablo, Peter, and Pedro, and then we'll take questions at the end. Now, to send questions, I please ask you to send your questions through the Q&A box at the bottom because they're easier to manage. And if you're in YouTube, that I see there is a few people in there in YouTube, please also like us so that we can send you next video, uh, more videos next time. Um, 
send them through the chat and we'll bring them in, okay? And we'll take them at the end, okay? And yes, you know, there's been a lot of questions about this. We are recording the session and the materials and the recordings will be available thereafter. So if you can only stay for an hour, two hours or three hours, all of it will be available and you'll be able to share it with your colleagues. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Pablo to please uh, put your presentation on the screen and we'll begin, we'll get this rolling. And I want, I'm looking forward to receiving all of your questions and you know, beginning actually to learn more about this mighty component that we all have to learn a lot <laughs> very, very quickly. Okay, Pablo, perfect, we can see it. So go right ahead. All right, uh, like I said, a pleasure to be here with you guys. I'm gonna talk to, to you a little bit about the cost trends and investment trends for electrolyzers. So I'm gonna take a little bit of the global view and then let my colleagues dig a little bit deeper into the markets. Uh, uh, but first, before we do that, maybe a little bit of context or actually why this is so relevant, right? Um, of course, we know we need to reduce emissions. Uh, this is just some of Irina's views on how much do we need to reduce by 2050. There needs to be a reduction of 30, around 37 gigatons of CO2. And now, of course, uh, most of it will come from the contribution from renewables. Uh, efficiency, of course, energy efficiency is very important. And electrification of the energy system will just continue to be ramped up. Um, and of course, hydrogen will play a, an important role in this um, and in other aspects of the decarbonization goals. So we need to look at li a little bit deeper into what, what it, the role will be for hydrogen. It's still quite uncertain. So there are lots of different ways and opinions around this, but um, we'll look at some of those aspects now. In terms of uh, how much electricity will be needed for hydrogen, we have some estimates here from our uh, World Energy Transitions Outlook analysis um, from IRENA. So we know that we estimate that by 2050, um, around 20,000 um, terawatt hours will be needed um, just to, to produce green hydrogen. So this is about more or less the current global consumption currently. Right, so um, just to give you a, a ballpark figure with that. So a lot needs to happen to get there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, another aspect is important. This will not happen if, if we not find ways to integrate the electrolyzers into the power system. So I'm sure my colleagues will be discussing more about that. So we need very smart systems and synergies with renewable power generation to achieve that. And thirdly, um, the way for this to be achieved um, is to innovate in order to um, allow the cost for the electrolyzers to continue to come down. Now, uh, we'll discuss a little bit more about how to get there. There's pretty much three things we need to um, account for. The first, um, we need competitive electricity, competitive renewable electricity, in fact. Uh, we need the electrolyzers themselves to be competitive and only there we will find competitive green hydrogen at uh, economic scale, right? So if we look at the first of those components, competitive electricity, uh, at Irina, we keep track, uh, we, you may know one of our, some of our reports, we keep track of, um, we have a very large database, the so-called Irina Renewable Cost Database, of uh, worldwide projects of all renewable technologies. You can see some of the insights here. Um, let me just show you that. So here we see three metrics. So that one is the total install cost is used dollars per kilowatt. Second metric, the capacity factor. And third metric, the famous levelized cost of electricity. Um, just as an example in, in the, the yellow or orange or yellow actually uh, line here is photovoltaic. So you see a dramatic decline in photovoltaic total install cost. This is mostly like the CapEx uh, uh, declining 82% from 2010, between 2010 and 2021. We're working on the 22 numbers as we speak. <laughs> so we'll have them soon, hopefully. And then uh, of course, improvements in the capacity factor, this, in the case of PV, relate a lot to the shift towards more higher radiation areas for projects. In, and, and you have seen how this has, has um, come up with a 
uh, resulting in a very low levelized cost of electricity, which is already uh, below the range for fossil fuel cost range um, uh, power production. So just to get there, pretty much the message is renewables are already quite competitive. Um, in fact, in 2021, we estimated that at least 73% of the whole new utility scale capacity in the world cost less than the cheapest fossil fuel option. So we see continuous declines. We'll, of course, there, are, there were some hiccups starting in 2021 with supply chains, um, but we'll see how this, um, we're, we're analyzing currently how these costs will, will be evolving. Um, and um, we have that um, expectation that uh, the 2022 numbers will give us more light into that. But we need a competitive electrolyzers as well. We've analyzed what has happened historically to electrolyzer costs. I'll show you a little bit more of that, but just to get it in a, on a nutshell, um, between 20, 2005, of course, electrolyzers are a very old technology, as some of my colleagues will highlight. Um, so we have long-term data for electrolyzers, of course, uh, not for the recent years there's, um, where the focus has been on green hydrogen, but, but for the long-term data, we see 61% cost reduction for alkaline electrolyzers, 67% cost reduction. This is in terms of, um, of the CapEx um, for PEM electrolyzers between 20, 2005 and 20, 2020. Now, in terms of uh, performance, which is very important, of course, uh, we see uh, 52 and 54 kilowatt hours of electricity consumption per kilogram of hydrogen production. A little bit of where this came from is an analysis we did on actual <laughs> electrolyzer cost. Um, so we can see that trend here. Uh, so that 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 was the the data that we've analyzed to reach that. Um, we've we did some analysis on um, the average points for performance. These are evolving now very rapidly, and the efforts are being placed. And lots of efforts are being placed, and we'll talk about in the other sessions more about R&D, of course, and innovation that is going on. But just roughly speaking, important things here are the AEL systems are, alkaline systems are 52 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen. And the difference between the system level and the stack level is quite pronounced for AEL, whereas the more simpler systems, PEM, the difference is not so pronounced. So. I'm sure there will be more insights into these developments in the technology sections, but I just want to give an overview. And of course, then if we have these two elements, we can then think of green competitive hydrogen. This is just showing a view of that. So it's on the, what is depicted here is the, the cost per production of kilogram of hydrogen. Uh, there's two, pretty much two scenarios that are, depicted here. One is with quite relatively high electricity price of 65 US dollars per megawatt, and then with lower electricity prices, which are now more realistically actually in most uh, becoming more and more the, the actual norm, around 20 US dollars per megawatt hour. So you can see there um, the differences in um, the range is just given up by different costs of CAPEX for the electrolyzers, so 650 to 1,000. This provides a little bit of a range. You can see that uh, between 2030, 2035 already um, with low electricity, um, green hydrogen is becoming extremely competitive against fossil fuel range options, right? I won't go into the details. That you can find some more details in this report called Green Hydrogen Cost Reduction. Um, then, uh, again, how to get there? What are the, what needs to happen to achieve uh, lower electrolyzer costs? Uh, first, as mentioned, there needs to be innovation. There needs to be scaling up of the manufacturing. This is still happening, actually starting to happen now. Uh, scaling up of the modules, uh, and then learning by doing, also learning effects from experience. Um, as with other markets, of course, and with other technologies, we've seen similar cases for PV, for example, in the past. And this, is, this cycle is also um, similar for, for the development of the cost for hydrogen electrolyzers. But 
maybe just to get a little bit on the details. So we need in terms of innovation, a very important aspect of that is in improving standardization. So the whole quality infrastructure that is uh, imp uh, important to build around the whole hydrogen value chain. Um, then of course, efficiency we discussed and uh, interestingly and often very forgotten part of that is the durability of the systems, which can make a huge difference in terms of the economics. Then for scaling up manufacturing, we'll see more um, emphasis on increased throughputs, automation, um, players achieving the one gigawatt scale per year. So, and we'll, we'll, we're starting to see some of that, the efforts towards that. In terms of the modules, of course, it seems uh, the focus is on improving utilization. Um, and of course, uh, there also automatic assembly will pay, play some uh, important role. And in terms of learning by doing, of course, uh, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from the deployment of the projects themselves. I'm sure my colleagues will mention some of those. So I won't go deep into that. Just uh, to give a flavor of where, what this means in terms of cost reduction potential. So we're starting out today around between four and five, let's say like that, use dollars per kilogram of, of hydrogen. And then of course, the majority of the reduction potential can be realized uh, between these two aspects of lower electrolyzer costs, which are like the heart of the electrolysis system and lower electricity costs. So you see the big impact that lower electricity costs. Of course, this has a lot of implications that go a little bit beyond the scope of, of this uh, topic. So they have a, this, this, just this aspect has a lot of implications for trade of hydrogen, right? So as to where, where to import and to export, right? But um, just to give a fallback for you, of course, efficiency can is the next big thing. And then the rest is better utilization, a lifetime of electrolysis, which is like I said, not to be neglected. And the WAC, a little bit uncertain in these times, of course, like the as the technology risk or the so-called perceived technology risk starts to decline, of course, we might be able to see lower WACs, uh, lower cost of capital, but that also, of course, is depending on the interest rates, right? And and the scale of the of the markets and on many things. Uh, just to get a little bit of a feeling to finalize on where um, the investment trends are. We've done an exercise preliminary to come up with combining our deployment and our cost data to understand what it means in terms of millions of dollars in investment. For AEL systems, we estimated that the, the cumulative investment by 2021 was around 200 million. Of course, lots of that was, uh, you see here, this is the, this is, this is showing the actual yearly investments and this is showing the cumulative investments so you see here this is china which uh added 152 megawatts in 2021 so of course that's contributing a lot for in the case of ael for pem uh it's been a little bit more mixed but uh also germany um is the green bar here has been uh, really increased uh deployment in 2021 so their um, the investment uh, cost the investment total investment is uh, by 2021 is around 155 million. So you notice that please the scale is a little bit different here. So not to be compared this way. So um, just to get a feeling on that, of course, we're working on more detailed analysis around investment and capacity trends and um, both uh, costs. So Arena is doing actually a lot of work on all sorts of aspects of the value chain which I'd be happy to share at some other point. But I'll leave it at there. i pass it on to the colleagues. Thank you Thank very you. much, Pablo. How interesting. I wonder whether we can start considering ourselves either alkaline people or PEM people, like Apple and Android, and take it from there. Every time I, I ask the question, no one wants to answer, so I won't ask it here. But uh, it seems like to be two schools of thought, almost. So. <laughs> Next, Peter, you are up. So if you want to show your screen, there is a few questions already for you, Pablo, and you know, more general for all of the panelists. So if you want to take a look at them, you know, and then perhaps um, you know, we could at the end take some of the more sort of complex ones. Peter, good to go. Great. Uh, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen Great. and we can hear you. Go awesome. right ahead. So again, my name is Peter Marin. I'm with Guidehouse Insights. Um, so I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the um, the expected trajectory of the electrolyzer prices. Um, you know what's driving the values, some of the market trends we're seeing, and um, you know who who are some of the biggest manufacturers to watch. 
uh, I prepared a few slides. Uh, some of them get pretty dense, so I'll do my best to to highlight uh, the most important points. Um, so I, I'm going to start this first slide uh, with a caveat because this chart on the right came from a report that I wrote around this time last year, maybe a, a little longer ago. So, you know, a lot can change in a year and, and a lot has changed in the past year. And I think that that's probably one of the first points I want to make, which is that the electrolyzer market is still really nascent and um, it, it's not something you can learn and walk away from. You, you kind of need to keep your finger on the pulse of the market because things can change so quickly. Um, and for instance, just in this past year, I mean, we've seen the start of the war in Ukraine, inflation, commodity price spikes, various supply chain issues have gotten worse. And and um, there's been new legislation in the U.S. and Europe, really big legislation that could kind of, you know, move the needle on what we're talking about with electrolyzers. Um, and then, you know, those are the outside factors. There's also changes that occur uh, for the electrolyzer manufacturers themselves regarding production costs and, and timeline targets. Um, so, you know, we at Guidehouse are probably overdue to update this pricing model that you see here. Um, but for now, it serves, you know, uh, just fine to illustrate my point, which is that, you know, we at Guidehouse, um, you know, are of the view that electrolyzer prices will continue to decline for all technologies over the next 10 years. Um, obviously, some will fall at a faster rate. Um, some of the key drivers, uh, as Pablo, you know, kind of alluded to is um, new technologies and technological advancements, um, the automation of, of manufacturing, which is already starting to happen, uh, standardization of, of designs and products, um, the, the learning curves, uh, the learning by doing, and of course, the, the economies of scale, they're all big factors. Um, when we look at different technologies, solid oxide is currently the most expensive technology, uh, as much as three times more expensive than some of the other designs. Um, this technology will most likely remain the most expensive through 2030 uh, because it's it's got a very complex nature and it operates at very high temperatures. Uh, and all that adds to the cost and, and uh, the cost of parts and materials. Um, but this technology will also see the largest price decline. We're forecasting a decline in solid oxide electrolyzer prices of about 48% between you know now and uh, 10 years out. Um, prices probably won't fall quite as hard or fast uh, for some of the more mature technologies like PEM and especially alkaline. Um, as Pablo showed, you know some some of these technologies have already seen cost reductions of 60% over the past 15 years. So um, they've been around for a long time. So they've already realized a lot of their learnings and, and cost savings. Um, the PEM and, 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 uh, and alkaline are already among the cheapest um, electrolyzers out there, but we still expect the prices to fall by about 35% for both of them between now and 2030. Um, the, uh, the AEM there you see is the, uh, the anion exchange membrane, which is, which is a fairly new design. It offers the flexibility of PEM without the need for the precious metals. Um, it still needs a lot more research, but, uh, but it, it could very well be the, the cheapest electrolyzer design by 2030. Uh, moving on here on slide, the next slide, I'd like to get into some of the uh, drivers that'll help reduce the prices for electrolyzers. Uh, as part of my report last year, I looked into the learning rates and found that electrolyzers could see learning rates of 15% or better, even as high as 20%, according to some literature. Um, which is, you know, that's still well below what the solar industry saw over the past 10 years. Um, you'll see on the right that learning rates also uh, depend largely on the electrolyzer technology uh, type and component. Um, today, most electrolyzer deployments are, are custom designs. Um, the lack of standardization can bring delays and, and other challenges to that, that ultimately inflate prices. Um, but as, as capacity starts to scale up, manufacturers will gain you know, important experiences, um, which could lead to the standardization and optimization of their designs, uh, which in turn could ultimately lower prices. And um, economies of scale are also really worth noting, um, both you know, the manufacturing rate and the module size. Both of them matter. It's it's estimated that the cost of uh, uh, to manufacture a PEM stack could drop by as much as fifty percent when they're being produced at a rate of a thousand per year or greater. Um, the, most electrolyzer units today have a capacity of less than ten megawatts, but as the projects uh, the project capacities eventually approach a thousand megawatts or you know giga projects, um, what we're talking about is really kind of loading up a lot of different electrolyzer units to a single site and uh, using a shared balance of plant. But when you take that giggle project approach, it's estimated that stack expenses could fall by as much as 75% when you compare it to the megawatt scale projects we're seeing now. Um, 
There you go. Uh, this slide just flags a couple of trends we've been seeing in the market. Um, we, expect, we expect the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. Uh, to really accelerate the deployment of projects across the U.S. Uh, we're also keeping a very close eye on uh, critical minerals such as platinum and iridium. Um, any rapid deployment of electrolyzers, especially PEM, could lead to a material shortage. Um, so we're also keeping a really close eye on um, the ability to recover some of these materials from end of life electrolyzers or other equipment that could potentially alleviate any potential um, material shortfall. Uh, towards the bottom, you know, we see uh, actually in the, the grid up there on the top right, you know, we see Europe uh, is an early mover of the hydrogen economy. No surprises there. Um, but the, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S., uh, could be a game changer. It could put the U.S. in pole position to take the lead. Um, we're also seeing uh, a very high growth potential for the Asia-Pacific market, uh, mostly in the second half of the decade. Uh, I might be running a little short on time. Um, you know, you can tell me if I am, but um, uh, okay, I'll be probably... Then, yeah. Okay, yeah. I should be pretty brief on these next two slides. Um, you know, this one, again, Europe is out to a quick start. Uh, according to our own um, hydrogen electrolyzer tracker um, at Guidehouse, we have we see about 500 projects, a little over 500 projects have been announced in Europe. And to kind of put that in context, that's twice as many as the rest of the country uh, have um, in the queue uh, combined. So Europe is definitely out to a very quick start. Um, but again, this can this can change with the IRA. Uh, the IRA could spur up and probably will spur a whole new wave of, of uh, projects in the US. Um, and, 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 and other regions could also be entering the market with gusto. We have some, some really large scale export projects uh, that are gathering momentum in parts of Latin America, including Chile, uh, the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and Oman in particular and in um, the Asia Pacific region, uh, Australia, especially. Uh, a lot of these projects are, are, are early and um, you know, uh, there's a considerable degree of uncertainty around them, but it's important to keep an eye on these projects because they're, they're very large. Uh, finally, um, this last slide introduces some of the biggest manufacturers uh, and what makes them unique. Um, last year, uh, Guidehouse also published a leaderboard report of these OEMs. And uh, what we found when we were ranking these companies based on their strategy and execution, uh, Plug Power in the US, ITM Power in the UK, Nell Hydrogen in Norway, and John Cockerell in, the, uh, in Belgium were the four that scored the highest. Um, of course, ITM has fallen on some hard times financially in the past 12 months, uh, mostly stemming from production delays. Uh, so these rankings might not be the same if we re revisited the leaderboard today. But again, it kind of emphasizes that so much can change within one year. Um, in the contenders group, uh, we have Sunfire uh, in Germany and Bloom Energy in the U.S. Uh, both Sunfire and Bloom uh, focus on solid oxide. And then we have Anapter in Germany, which is the leading manufacturer of the anion exchange membrane electrolyzers. Um, also worth mentioning are the Tyson Group and Siemens, both of Germany, and Acceler in the U.S., which is, um, was recently rebranded. It was Cummins New Energy. Um, so that's all I have prepared, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to, to have a conversation and, and field any questions either in real time or, or after the, the uh, workshop. Thank you very much, Peter. I invite you to take a look, if you like, at the questions that we already have there. And, okay. uh, and if you can go answering some, because we have 13 open at the moment, and then we'll take them afterwards, after Pedro's presentation, which is next up. So Great. please, Pedro, if you could prepare your presentation. And thank you very much, uh, Peter. It's been really interesting. I love the leaderboard. And I would love to see the 2023 version and see how it changes. Well, we'll, we'll be working on it, and I'm happy to show it. Let's see. Pedro, you're ready? Yep. Okay. I am ready. And I don't know how we will top up these two fantastic presentations, but I, I will do my best. Really good, Peter and Pablo. Uh, uh, I. Would like to start oh, just yeah. to give a few words who we are. AFRI is the company I'm representing, is a Swedish and Finnish uh, uh, engineering and consultancy company. Uh, we actually are quite unknown on maybe on m many markets on the hydrogen business, but we are a global company with over 19,000 people working in different areas, infrastructure, energy, and of course, uh, power to X and hydrogen, and of course, electrolyzers is one of the area. And Electrolyzers, hydrogen, and of course, power to X. It's impossible, at least for me, to talk about electrolyzers and not mention 
power to x in a context. Um, power to x, as you know, is the means the conversion between from electrical power to x, which is actually the usage of hydrogen. And this is very important when you look at the 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 the, the amount of applications that we have for hydrogen. Uh, and talking about hydrogen, many people still talk about hydrogen as something innovative. And actually, I would say, and some of you, Pablo and Peter, you mentioned this, it's nothing innovative as actually as producing a hydrogen. Electrolysis is a really proven concept. So it's I like always to mention that we are actually have been producing green hydrogen uh, in very large scale, in larger scales that we actually do not have at the time being. Uh, here in this picture, we can see uh, a 300 megawatts uh, built a plant, a had like plant built in 1927. So, and this was, we still do not have a, a similar electrolyzer plant in this size. And even later on, we had 150 megawatt in Bloomfjord in Norway. So this means that when we are looking at nowadays at least large scales, it's actual things that we have done before. So it's a, basically the concepts are existing. Electrolyzer technology is already existing, of course, but from this time until now, there are there have been many improvements. But as I normally say that the electrolyzer business has been hibernating for a long, long time. Uh, and that also creates a challenge that I will mention in, in, in the next few slides on ramping up from having a very small business to come to very large scale. And coming to large scale, of course, I also, and this is not my word, I, I, I use this from uh, another uh, uh, person working on hydrogen and is normally saying like, when we are talking about large scale electrolyzers, either we are talking in PowerPoint or AutoCAD because we do not have these plants. And, Unfortunately, we still see some players talking about these plants as they would be uh, something that is proven. And the technology itself, it is proven, but the upscaling is actually turning out to be a large, large uh, uh, challenge. Um, and of course, it is a challenge and the amount of uh, uh, applications, as I mentioned, the power to x concept uh, uh, needed, it makes the market huge. We do not need to even look at, for example, the transport sector that has been coming up in different waves of introduction, uh, where the fuel cell cars, it has been in different countries, different attempts. And um, the first time I was working with hydrogen 15 years ago, in that time, I thought to myself, well, okay, yes, we are going to have the fuel cell uh, vehicles uh, running in a few years and it's been 15 years and we still do not have that it's really local and it's still difficult to 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 uh, uh, to see that implementation but if you look at the industry for example and uh, having the privilege of living in sweden we have only here two very large uh, green steel plants green steel players that actually make it possible to decarbonize the steel industry that stands for almost 10 or between seven to almost nine, ten percent of the CO2 uh, uh, emissions in the world. Uh, of course, what does this mean? This means that we need to have many large scale projects, many large scale plants. And this is only green steel. We go to green ammonia is the same. Methanol, very much potential. And also here in Scandinavia, we see a huge, huge market for this. Sustainable aviation fuel and so many other applications. Well, I think Pablo mentioned this, but I normally say that, of course, electrolyzers, they have a very, very important key in decarbonization. Uh, of course, we could be talking about different colors on hydrogen, but talking about electrolyzer, we can only talk about green hydrogen, in my opinion. And of course, green hydrogen is a key or is actually uh, 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 the key for making enabling power to X to decarbonize almost a third a third of global emissions. So this is interesting. And of course it's necessary because we need basically to reduce for every decade uh, our emissions by half of them. Uh, well, why are we talking about this? We actually at AFI, we have different uh, uh, capabilities on working on this. So my opinion here or my, my, my uh, uh, contribution here is to give uh, actually hands-on we're working in different large scale green hydrogen plants. We are working in e-fuels. We are covering basically the complete uh, 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 value chain of the hydrogen. Um, and we actually, last year we del delivered more than 120 projects 
in 2022, so worldwide, uh, this gives us a very, very good uh, uh, um, um, reference to, co to analyze what challenges we have and what would be the best strategy to optimize large scale and power to X hydrogen plants. Well, uh, there is this few very simple steps. Um, I would start by doing a very good and thorough and proper technology and OEM selection and scrutinization. We see that, for example, they, we see from our perspective that uh, technology suppliers, OEMs, are having a lot of troubles to deliver in time, to deliver actually to everyone. So basically, when we are uh, representing a client doing this kind of work, scrutin doing the scrutinization and doing the technology selection, we see actually that if your client uh, is, does not have an, a very, very appealing project, we might be not even selected. We might not be even attracted for the OEM. And this might sound a bit too harsh for the, I think that we have some OEMs present here, but this is how we are experienced because the amount of project is so large that of course the OEMs, they do not have time to go after every project. So at a certain moment, they are actually choosing the projects where they are going to quote. Uh, and of course, technology is important. I mean, we need to find the right technology for the right application. Uh, another parameter that is also very important is actually dimensioning. And all projects, and uh, of course, needs to be optimized to the highest level. And the electrolyzer is one, one part of it, together with the technology, because certain technologies of electrolyzers will help, for example, in, uh, in diminishing the cost, for example, of compression. If you, in case, for example, you have high pressure alkal alkaline electrolysis or PEM, uh, and of course the storage. Everyone knows that working in hydrogen storage is very expensive. So you need really to optimize the maximum of your storage. Mm -hmm. uh, another point that I see also that uh, I've been seen as a showstopper is actually the site itself. Um, the site that you choose for your project is very, very important. And even we, I, 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 I as an engineer and, and with hands-on experience on hydrogen, um, I find difficult to say, for example, what is the levelized cost of hydrogen in five years or in 10 years? And my answer is normally, it depends. And it almost depends on where you are going to place your plant, where in geographically. I cannot see that a, a, a electrolyzer or the levelized cost of hydrogen or the, the, the capex will be the same if you consider a site in the northern part of Sweden or in the southern part of Chile. So there is parameters that are very, very independent. It can be even a showstopper. For example, looking at permitting. Some areas of the world, you do not have per in permitting, for example, for using use of the water and the utilities also. And of course, as some mentioned, renewable energy sources. I mean, it's a matter of cost, it's a matter of availability. And we have seen or are seeing actually we're helping clients uh, that actually uh, are not having their grid connection license in time. And this is postponing their investment and investors do not want to wait. They want the project as quick as possible and to start because if, they, if you wait five months or six months or two years, there is no investment. So. These are, the, I think, the parameters that should be addressed. And going to my last slide, I know the time is just about to run up. Uh, there are, of course, challenges. Besides all this, I would say that it, the electrolyzer business requires also more competence. We see uh, that in Europe, at least, there is not much competence uh, courses uh, um, university uh, specialized uh, courses on hydrogen or power to X. I think now there is a, a new trend coming because some countries are actually investing on this, especially Italy and Spain. We see also here in Sweden, we ourselves at AFI, we are co working together a lot with, with uh, different uh, high schools and with uh, universities to try to promote this uh, by offering, for example, uh, master thesis students to make their master thesis with us so that they we can quickly integrate them in our in our projects that require a lot of resources. We also see that, of course, when we do not have uh, large scale electrolyzer plants worldwide, how can we have more people, much people working with this? I mean, it's impossible. You saw the pictures on the on the old plants in Norway. It's many, many years ago. Uh, the availability of electricity is also a showstopper. We see, as I mentioned, water, part of the utilities, I mean, remember, potable, potable water is a scarce source. 
Uh, I think that there are some countries that are really looking at very large scale uh, electrolyzers because they have a lot of renewables, for example, from solar, but they have very, very scarce sources of water. And this could be very controversial that you would build, for example, large scale de uh, uh, desalinization plants for producing water, highly pure water for this, when people are actually uh, not having drinkable potable water. Mm? And of course, the last, and this is actually the hot topic for the today, it is large scale electrolyzer. It is a challenge for this implementation of projects. As I said, there aren't uh, electrolyzer plants over 300 megawatts that have been built yet. Like I say, PowerPoint to AutoCAD. Uh, and we see also another trend that has actually, from my, my experience is that when talking to different OEMs, we see that the electrolyzer uh, uh, costs or let's say the price of the electrolyzers is decreasing or will decrease because of different optimizations because of the large scale production but actually what we are seeing is the other way around we are actually seeing that the demand is so big the demand is so large and the supply is actually so little that the prices are actually increasing and i think that this trend trend will hold for some time until all the large scale facilities manufacturing facilities will be up and running and then I think we will see then a trend of uh, a decrease on the prices. Hmm? Thanks for listening, and I'm happy to uh, list to answer your questions. Hmm? Thank you very much, Pedro, and also to the rest of the panelists. These have been great presentations, and I, I think we've heard a little bit of all of the aspects of the supply chain. We started with so renewables in the big picture, then we went on to players, you know, and, and, and people who were working in the in the supply chain. And then also we've looked also at what we do with hydrogen there are, you know, and the possible industries there are. So I think we've covered most things. Um, there are a bunch of questions, but before that, I just wanted to ask a couple that I think are important questions that we need to discuss. One is uh, more for Pablo, but you guys feel free to also add on. And it's like, of course, what, what we are saying, I mean, the, the, the carbonization goals are saying that hydrogen or green hydrogen or low carbon, zero carbon hydrogen, however you want to call it, is going to be a key piece of the decarbonization pro uh, process. Yes. If so, then we need to get the costs of hydrogen down yeah, so that they can be competitive with gray hydrogen, with blue hydrogen. And for that to happen, essentially, competitiveness is the first thing. The cost has to come down. So the first question, as I said, most for you, Pablo, is what needs to happen in the policy side uh, to unlock the cost reduction potential of electrolyzers as we need it? And are electrolyzers the key to un solving this issue or does the answer lie actually elsewhere? Yeah, thank you. Brother. I mean, uh, we already see in the last actually two, three years already a huge change in in the country's attention on on this issue we've seen uh, as some of the colleagues mentioned some very important policy changes in the us uh, now recently in europe as well and of course the it's like very high on the government's agendas to to continue to uh, firstly to provide where possible um, our suggestion is for governments to provide long term signals that can actually um, Enable enable the the development of the whole value chain for for hydrogen. So we need a very comprehensive um, policy uh, approach that is system integrated. So it's not just isolated in, into one aspect of the value chain, but it actually conveys the whole aspects of the value chain. Therefore, that's why at Arena we try to com combine these insights in a very holistic way so that we can. Um, manage that aspect of that. But uh, this means, uh, among many other issues that some of my colleagues have mentioned, regulations, we need increased focus on standardization and, and quality, of course, not to be forgotten. But uh, pretty much in, there needs to be certainty also for the investment to, to flow, right? So as we see, this is actually what's happening in some of the regions and countries that have established certain, quite certain and firm policy uh the money is starting to flow towards those regions right so all the manufacturers all the developers are starting to focus more on those regions and this is uh an aspect and the other aspect is there need to be the geopolitical uh, aspects that need to be accounted for because increasingly hydrogen as as all the energy supply is becoming a, a security issue for many countries right so um, there are a lot of different aspects to take care in terms of also in terms of the trade that I mentioned, 
and what what entitles to that. So um, some a very important aspect that was also mentioned uh, on um, upskilling or skilling uh, skills development is very important for 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 the regulate, regulatory part for the efforts from the governments for the policy also because they cannot be is a little bit of a chicken and egg situation as some uh, Pedro was mentioning that. The, you cannot have a big industry if you don't have the skills, right? But um, um, so this is also a very important aspect. Thank you. And Peter, I wanted to kind of, it's the same question, but it, with a different flavor for you. It's about the IRA and yeah. what does that mean in electrolyzer development yeah. in, the, in the US particularly, and I suppose worldwide, because it's such a large market that is going to shift things everywhere. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, yeah, it does dovetail into your previous question. I mean, the IRA doesn't, it, what it introduces is the production production tax credit. So it subsidizes the production of hydrogen, which makes it comp makes green and low carbon hydrogen competitive with gray hydrogen. And, um, you know, so, so the IRA by itself doesn't really support or subsidize the electrolyzer manufacturers. Um, but the PTC, the production production tax credit will uh, make the U.S. hydrogen market a lot more attractive on a global scale. It will, uh, a lot of projects are, are, are already in the works um, as a result of the IRA. And, um, you know, I think it'll have kind of a, a, a different approach to it, but it, it's incentivizing electrolyzers to be built within the United States because of that, that environment. Um, you know, let's not forget also the, the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed in the United States a year prior uh, that allocated, I think, $8 billion to six to 10 um, hydrogen hubs in the US. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot for the electrolyzer manufacturers to get excited about and, and to stand to benefit uh, within this hydrogen race. Um, a couple of projects that have been announced in the United States post IRA, I think Nell is uh, is opening uh, is expanding its U.S. factory and, and opening another. Um, Hydrogen Pro is planning a 500 megawatt factory. Um, Elo H is a startup um, that is focused on the an ion exchange membrane. Um, they've announced two factories. Uh, it's a startup, so low confidence there. And then I, I also wanted to note um, Plug Power, which is a, a really big electrolyzer manufacturer within the United States. I listened to their earnings call just a few weeks ago, and they were alluding to they did they were pretty guarded about it, but they they were alluding to meaningful activities that that are happening behind the scenes in the United, in, in North America and the United States. Um, and and they kind of suggested that they would have some big announcements to make of their own later this year. So I mean I think the IRA, it, it does it a different way by kind of subsidizing the production of the fuel, but it, it'll have a similar effect to kind of give uplift to the electrolyzer manufacturing as well. I mean, if anything, what is done is like so many firms are actually investing into this area, you know, to produce electrolyzers. However, I do have a little bit of an issue there with the, and Gary here asked this question actually from the, he says, you know, the, the component supply chain uh, is an issue as the ramp up happens to be between 2025 and 2030. We kind of need it to be early, right? So what is happening with this, uh, like, I guess this phase, you know, like we're, we're, we're working at, a, we're being really like, we're not working in the same timeline, so to speak. So how do you guys see this happening or, you know, progressing in the next few years? Can we hit our targets for 2030? If I could answer that, I think it is possible, but it, it's going to take some effort. And I think getting back to what Peter said with these announcements of different factories that are being planned, and I mean, to give a perspective of, 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 of the amount necessary of electrolyzers and to where we need to achieve, if we would be talking about, for example, looking at, you, you mentioned Hydrogen Pro, I think, that has planning capacity, uh, plant capacity of 500 megawatt. It means that a 500 megawatt plant capacity uh, means that it could only de deliver 500 megawatt electrolyzers in one year. This is like the the the, the threshold for, for delivery. Uh, when we look at one single, one single project, okay, uh, uh, for example, for a, a green ammonia factory to replace a gray to green ammonia in an average size. I'm not going to talk about the very large scale. We are talking somewhere between 500 and one gigawatt electrolyzer capacity needs. One project. So 
I, I don't know how many factories or how many gray ammonia factories there are in the world, but but I, I understand that the number is very large. So so that conversion is 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 basically uh, impossible to achieve in a few years. This is of course is a, is a ramping up, and of course that we are talking about one single supplier. Um, it is possible to achieve, but but I don't think that we will need to, we need to take in a few phases. Uh, we normally recommend, for example, when we're talking in in project planning for electrolysis plant, in, in splitting actually the electrolysis plant in two steps, and this is actually to avoid uh, the problem that we, we we come into contact with suppliers that cannot deliver the complete plant. So you are actually splitting the delivery into into plants. For example, if you have a 500 megawatt, there could be a good suggestion of of implementing first a 200 megawatt in the first step and then a 300. And again, this connected to the fact that we do not have competence. There is not enough trained personnel for operate these plants. So. Why not do it in in two steps? Involve the 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 the, the company that is developing this in the construction, in the engineering, etc. So I think this could be a good strategy. Hmm. Thank you very much. So we have a few minutes. So I'm going to ask you if you want to answer any questions specifically. Okay. Take a look, and we'll, we'll we we can answer that later. But I did want to ask you a question that is important. I think about markets. Um, often when you look at a new technology or a new area. And I understand, Pedro, that this has been going on for a long time. You know, uh, electrolysis is an old technology, but so are electric cars. You know, they're also an old technology that kind of somewhat survived there in a very small, like a thread line, right? And now we're revisiting and we're saying, okay, we want more of this. Um, at the beginning of a technology, it, you find a lot of different options. You know, they kind of compete with one another. And then over time, there is like a very heavy, usually technology uh, consolidation. So if you look, at, for example, at the wind industry, you had like three, the, the, the turbine with the three blades and four blades, five blades different. And then eventually they all kind of standardized into one. Um, do you see this happening here or are these technologies different enough and they attend to different parts of uh, necessities, I suppose, of the of, of brand designs uh, enough that we could have a number of technologies at the same time? I think, yeah, of course, we have already a, a few number of technologies. I think it were mentioned both uh, the, the alkaline and the PEM. And within alkaline, you have atmospheric and, and, and pressurized. So you actually have different ways of choosing your electrolyzer. And there are some emerging technologies. I like to, uh, the, the, to talk about this that we see the solid oxide, oxide electrolyzer cells. I believe actually that they have very, very strong potential. Um, and I think that in the future, we will see in a very uh, long term perspective, we will probably see a solid oxide electrolysis cells being adapted to current uh, alkaline plants. I think there are some some companies looking at this. And I think that that could be like, you know, not step two, not step three. I think we are doing a step 10 in the future. Um, so so there will be different configurations. And uh, I think that. Uh, I understand what you mean with this standardization. I think that uh, uh, looking at the electrolyzer technology, and it, it comes back to a very nerd engineering level, which is electrochemistry. And when you look at the uh, at the process of splitting water with electricity, there are some some aspects that determine, and it is the ver the speed that you change your electricity you know and that actually changes how you need to design the process and it, it it comes also to the to the electrons level you know so so i think that you will be have having like two alternatives which is like a quick and fast response electrolyzer that is more adequate for for renewables for example and then you have a kind of a, a very stable profile electrolyzer that could be for example uh, alkaline so i think that these two groups without knowing how what will happen in the future i think we'll we'll have these two groups but remember also that if you have a pressurized ele electrolyzer you can actually uh, have a much quicker uh, uh, response time so 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 alkaline pressurized and pam oh, well they will be you know coming a bit closer and not the same and uh, well you need also to look at the amount of metals that you need, for example, precious metals to build each of the plants. You need, if you look in long term, when you have a 500 megawatt or a 700 megawatt, we are talking about 150 cell stacks that need to be recycled. I mean, there is we have we have a huge, huge uh, uh, 
uh, life cycle of the, the product to analyze in the future. Understood. We are not even close, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. No, I understood. I mean, that, that's, uh, I'm looking more for like the shorter answer. I understand there is so much complexity in this of whether, because there is two things here. One is technology for sure, you know, and you can say, oh, this one is better because, so say for example, we don't have enough materials of this sort. And then there is the issue of markets. I mean, bankability tends to focus on one technology specifically. And we've seen this time and time again. You know, others become obsolete pretty quickly. Say thin film, for example, compared to silicon, just because it's cheaper and then it kind of disappears. It's just not there anymore. You know, like I just wonder whether we can expect something like this. It's just not significant, if you like. So I don't know, Peter and Pablo, if you want to give me your quick answers. Yeah. Uh, so that we can, I can the try. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, I mean, uh, you touch upon many things, but I, I mean, pretty much it's about the drivers in the market, right? So one of the main drivers is, of course, scale. Whoever achieves scale first tends to dominate the market for some years, right? Because these things take time to develop, right? So manufacturing takes time to develop. So it's a often manufacturing involves very huge capex investments. So these will tend to change technology, big technology changes will only happen in cycles, right? According to those investment cycles, right? So you cannot expect, of course, there's tons of R&D going on for all of the existing uh, hydrogen technologies and newer ones. And of course, interestingly, uh, like I mentioned for Pedro, Pedro was mentioning the, the pressurized electrolyzers are very interesting. Higher uh, pressurized, higher temperature electrolyzers are interesting as well. So, of course, trying to improve efficiency and then the response time levels. But I think generally it's not all about the drivers. So, is there a scale enough? Like, is there an appetite for the is there a demand, right? And to achieve that scale, and there's is there the investment available to achieve that scale? Um, and yeah, some other drivers, of course, are a little bit beyond the scope of the vision that we can have. But uh, the other big ad driver is sustainability. Uh, we've touched a little bit upon materials. So what are the most sustainable ways to uh, to achieving these, these goals, right? In terms of materials uh, or um, the, the recyclability aspects, right, of, of the designs. And yeah, many other aspects, but maybe just to mention those two. And Peter, because we are running out of time, sadly. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't have a whole lot to add there. I think Pablo really, really encapsulated. I think, you know, the, the technological advances, the innovation, you know, uh, learning rates, all these things are important, I think, when it comes to, but, you know, I think with all these different designs, there are a lot of different components and materials that go into it, and they all need to be very closely looked at. I mean, the critical minerals that go into the PAM, I think, are really, most of them only come from two or three countries. And they're not always the most stable countries. So, I mean, these things need to be considered. Uh, there's a lot of different components beyond the minerals, you know, the, the metals that, that go into these. Um, so they're all potential hiccups in the supply chain. Um, so you need to be paying attention to all the components. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Suddenly we run out of time, which is a real shame because we had like 20 something questions open. I'm really sorry about this, but we just... <laughs> At this time, we need to move on to the session. I'd like to thank Pedro, uh, Peter, and Pablo because you've been PPP, actually, three Ps. You've been amazing. I would love to hear about these markets. And I think this is not going to be a once occurrence. You know, we're going to be watching this market very closely because there is so much, I'm not going to say mystery, you know, but I like lack of information around it. So we're going to be focusing on it. So I think we'll see you again very, very soon. Thank you very much. I'm no, going to pleasure. now. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you thank very you very soon, much. guys. And in the meanwhile, I am going to introduce to you the second session. So now we're, we're, my colleagues are doing is they're changing all the speakers. Don't worry, these people that we have here, the panelists, I invite them to stay because they're actually, we are now going to be talking to the actual manufacturers, the OEMs, um, which we have been talking about, a little bit more about the technology itself. And uh, after that, we, as I said earlier, we have a session about R&D. And I think you'll find this interesting because we're looking at... Uh, more direct ways, you know, with our membranes, sometimes with our electrolyzers, you know, how else we could uh, convert electricity into, into hydrogen or even solar energy directly into hydrogen. So there's other things that we have to look at there. Um, and next for the second session, uh, focusing on the electrolyzers technologies today, uh, we have Rasul with us. We have, uh, who is from Omnium, here, here you are. We have Rohit, 
from Rolls oh. Royce. Yeah, hi, Rohit. Yes. We have uh, David Wick from Anaptor, and we also have Omar uh, from Siemens Energy. I'd like you, Omar, as you come through, because they're being switched on, to switch on your cameras. And uh, sadly, we did have a speaker from Black Power who had to pull out just an hour before the, the, the webinar because of a family emergency. So it's a, it's a shame because I, I think I'd like to hear also from Black Power. But I think with four of you guys here today, we can have a good comprehensive view of the, um, the industry itself. So the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to welcome you all. I think you're all there now. Hi, Omar. Hi, Rohit. Hi, David. And the first thing I think I'd, I'd like you to please introduce yourselves to the people in the audience that they can uh, get to know you if you don't already. I'm going to start in the same uh, order of the of the PowerPoint. So, Rasul, if you start, please, and you introduce yourself, and then we'll take it Hi. from there. Yes, thank you, Belen. Uh, good day, everyone. Rasul Agatrani. I'm the Chief of Strategy and Marketing at Omium. Should we also have a brief introduction about the company, or is it for a later time? No, no, go on. Yes, introduce your yes. company and the kind of electrolyzers you guys do. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Belen. So Ohmium uh, is an electrolyzer manufacturing U.S. space. Uh, we have more than 400 people right now with the focus on the R&D of the electrolyzers, PEM electrolyzers specifically, in San Francisco Bay in the U.S. and in Bangalore in India. And we also have 500 megawatts of manufacturing capacity as we speak, uh, and we, we saw in the previous panel, there's a huge demand in the market for electrolyzers. So we are expanding the, uh, the manufacturing capacity from 500 megawatts to two gigawatts. Uh, I, would, I would leave the rest to the, you know, to the question and answer portion. Thank you very much, Rasul. Next, I'd like to ask uh, David Wick to please introduce yourself so people can get to know you in a little bit also about an after. Yes, thank you everybody for attending. My name is David Wick. I represent an after really for the whole Western Hemisphere. Um, I joined an after about six months ago. Just a little background on myself. I've been in hydrogen since 2015. Um, many of you viewing very likely are familiar with me. I started a blog on LinkedIn in 2015 about hydrogen that really kind of took off globally. Um, so since 2015, I've worked with I think four or five different companies to this point and really across the entire value chain of hydrogen, right? Different hydrogen generation technologies. At one point I sold fuel cell technology. At one point I sold hydrogen distribution or transportation. Um, so I've kind of been across that entire value chain. I really understand um, the operators of those different ecosystems. So um, with all that being said, it's nice to meet everybody. Thank you very much, David, for that comprehensive introduction. Next, I'd like Rohit to please introduce yourself. Hello and good evening, everybody from Berlin. My uh, name is Rohit Prasad. I'm a sales manager at uh, Rolls-Royce based out of Berlin. Now, if, if you're wondering what Rolls-Royce is now doing in the space of sustainability, electrolysis, green hydrogen, happy to get into that over the course of this. But just to give you a little bit of a hint, Rolls-Royce um, is divided into three major business units. We are active in the civil aerospace and defense and power systems. Power systems is the part of the business that is now not just pushing the conventional engine combustion technology, but also making a very strong um, move into sustainability. So this can include battery energy storage systems, green hydrogen, of course, electrolysis topic for today, um, hydrogen fuel cells, also hydrogen engines, and as well as P2X. We'll, we'll have a lot to talk about during this session. Really happy to be here and meet everybody else. Thank you, Rohit, and welcome you as well. And Omar, last but certainly not least, uh, how are you, Omar? Can you please introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Velen, and thank you, everyone, and, and the panel for uh, joining us in this discussion. So my name, Omar Rubio. I represent uh, Siemens Energy. I'm located in the U.S. and uh, responsible for bringing our power to x solutions and hydrogen technologies into the Americas uh, marketplace. Uh, Siemens Energy uh, as its own, obviously it's a, it's, a, it's a big company, as many of you know. Uh, and as one of the divisions, uh, there is one division that's called transformation of industry. Within transformation of industry, there is a, a business unit called uh, sustainable energy systems. As that, and that's the, uh, the division or the business unit that I represent today where we have our the core technology in terms of manufacturing is the electrolyzer PEM technology and, and you'll hear more about this as, as we as we progress in the discussion today 
Thank you. Well, thank you very much all to be uh, for being here with us today. And um, we're in this panel specifically, we're going to be focusing on the on the technology itself. I'm gonna ask my colleague to please remove the slide so that we can have easier conversation. Um, and in this panel, guys, we're, we're, we're not gonna have presentations. So we're gonna do is talk about the technology issues. And guess what? This is the, the one mm, time when it's going to be very easy for us to intertwine your questions. So please do send them through. All of the questions from the session before have been cleared so that you know we can start from scratch. And of course, we have prepared some questions to get us started, you know, but we would be delighted to actually hear from you. So first, can you, each of you, so that we are all clear, what is the technology choice of your companies? You know, just uh, so that everyone is very clear. So Rasul, Engomnion, you do both alkaline and PEM, you said, right? It's just PEM. Just PEM, okay. So it's uh, Siemens as well? Yeah. Siemens but... technology today in the portfolio is PEM, but we're also looking at alternative technologies. Okay, Rolls-Royce? So PEM for today. Also for PEM. Okay. We're actually so, missing yeah. alkaline here in the end. Look at this. And David, uh, you are AUM, correct? Yes, I represent an ion exchange membrane. Right now. We're the first okay. company to right now, it. Okay, so can I choose, like all of you guys are, are, are like three of you are PEM and you are AEM. Why those technologies specifically? I mean, you there are three of you in PEM, so maybe one of you can take the lead. Uh, and then also for you, David, I want to hear about why AEM, why is that the technology you guys are living with? So who wants yeah. to take the, go on, Rasul. Maybe I can start, and Rohit and Omar, please help me later with adding your points. So basically, if we look at the PEM technology, which is a you know robust and proven technology, initially invented for NASA to be used in the space station, all of us are using the same technology, the we are trying to uh, leverage that technology generally from three perspective and uh, to, you know, to make it easy for remembering, I call it 3D. Uh, the first dimension is that uh, PEM is extremely dense. So that means the energy density and the production density of the equipment is extremely good. Because when you look at the project development, owners are looking for the best hydrogen price, or as we discussed in the previous panel, level of cost of hydrogen. So having a dense device will help to have a much smaller land and also simplify and have less expensive balance of the plant. So that's dimension number one. The second dimension is the dynamic. We discussed, when we talk about green hydrogen is a combination of renewable energy resources, which are variable and the electrolyzer. And it's very important for us to have a dynamic electrolyzer that can easily follow all of those ups and downs of the renewable energy resources. Uh, that simplifies again, the balance of the system and supports the electrolyzer to uh, leverage the full energy generated by the renewable energy resources. So that's item number two or uh, the second D. And the third D is, is, I call it diverse. The PEM technology is very diverse in, in terms of integration into the end applications. Uh, the PEM technology has the electrochemical uh, compression that generates the hydrogen at the pressure and it uh, significantly simplifies all the down downstream applications. Also, it, gener it, it provides a lot of flexibility in terms of purity. So when we add the, all of the you know, advantages created from these three dimensions, it uh, significantly boosts the competitiveness of the level of cost of hydrogen and help the hydrogen project to have a, lo a much lower hydrogen price, which is the end goal for all of us in this industry. I can tell that you've told this story more than once, Rasul, because the 3D thing is very well thought out. <laughs> Did you want to add anything else, Rohit, Omar? Well, I might add maybe, well, one, one thing that's funny that David has to correct me afterwards but uh, a perspective that we take on PEM and alkaline, we think that both technologies are very, very, very good for certain applications. And it is a question really, I think that the whole industry is trying to solve at the moment, which are the applications that fit better for PEM, which are the ones that fit better for alkaline. It's not too easy to say at the moment um, where the answer really lies. So we have invested in the PEM technology for all the reasons that Rasul mentioned, we believe that there are certain technological advantages for PEM, even if the technology isn't scaled to the level yet where alkaline is and that the capex is obviously differing to some extent. But we think that's a matter of time with scale. Um, we can solve some of those challenges. 
even after that, however, we do think that all these technologies will have a solid place in the market. The demand is there to cover really all kinds of technologies. And a point that I think David would want to have to, let's say, correct me here, I think AEM is also a kind of PEM technology, which is polymer electrolyte membrane. So actually, you have all PEM guys here today. Oh, look at that. So at least we can sell this properly, good and proper. Uh, Omar, did you yeah. want to add anything there? And then we'll yeah, go yeah. with you, David. Yeah. Yeah, so so uh, all I want to say is basically second uh, uh, the thought that Rohit just explained, right? I think there's a place for all the technologies. Uh, you know, obviously Alkaline and PEM, because there are more mature technologies, that's what we hear more about in, in the marketplace today. But we'll eventually start uh, having more more of the solid oxide and AM technologies into the marketplace, and all and they all play an important role. You know, the market, and as you explained in the previous session, right, the market is is, is, is becoming explosive. But uh, to the point of the technology and why we chose PAM within Siemens Energy, you, I think the main, the main reason uh, is basically the dynamic, the second D that Rasul mentioned, right? It's, it, for, for us, from, Siem, from the background of Siemens Energy and becoming, you know, coming from the power generation sector and from the industry sector, it just, the technology pair well with, with uh, with us in, uh, getting introduced into the market now, how we develop the portfolio in, in the future that that will basically be driven by by the market. But but I agree with uh, many of you the dynamic aspect of PEM uh, with with renewable resources. It, it's almost like a, a good match. But there is a place for all these technologies as the, as the as the market develops. Yep. Thank you very much. So the bottom line here with PEM is it is. It adapts easier to renewable energy resources, hence for renewable or for green or even electrolytic uh, hydrogen based on renewables is, is much is a better fit, the first thing. So David, tell us about the different electrochemis electrochemistry of AEM then, because someone here, Bruno, has actually pinpointed the difference between PEM and AEM is a different electrochemistry. Yeah, so AEM stands for anion exchange membrane. And so we're exchanging negatively charged anions instead of protons. Um, essentially kind of to dummy this down, essentially we don't operate in a highly acidic environment. Um, and so we don't require those you know, rare noble metals that we've, we've talked about today, iridium, titanium, and platinum. Um, iridium alone has, has went up fourfold in price the last two years. Um, that will very likely continue to happen. Um, there's just, there's a limited amount of, of iridium on this planet. And so with us, we're not operating in that acidic environment. And so we can replace those noble metals with stainless steel and nickel. And so all, what this ultimately does, I mean, obviously we're coming to market with a much lower capex, but ultimately I think the big time long-term winner of this technology is it allows us to approach the industry differently, right? And especially from a USA perspective, everyone's after these 100 megawatt hubs and, and the federal government money. Um, the problem with, with these you know, 100 megawatt hubs is it forces you, you're, you're producing this mass amount of hydrogen. And I think question number one is who's using that hydrogen, right? And then question number two is how are you gonna get that hydrogen to that, that customer? And I think that's the fundamental problem in this industry is if we put up all these 100 megawatt hubs it's going to force us to liquefy hydrogen because uh, liquefied hydrogen is three times more energy dense than um, gasified hydrogen. And so when you transport this across distances, you need it to be in liquid form. Um, the problem with that is you're pouring an extreme amount of energy to liquefy hydrogen, right? You're super cooling it to minus 220 degrees. Um, you're probably very likely putting it into a diesel tanker truck. You're delivering it hundreds of miles away. Once it does get on site, you have to regasify that hydrogen. And so that whole process that I just talked about, really the transportation or distribution of hydrogen is the point in which, you know, green hydrogen doesn't make a whole lot of sense in my mind, right? You're pouring this extreme amount of energy just to transport the molecule. Um, and so our approach to the industry is, is different. We want to say, let's put down our electrolyzers at the point of consumption where it's actually being used. And I think where we separate ourselves is from a mobility perspective, right? There's not this 
gigantic demand for hydrogen from a mobility perspective. And so station operators want to be able to start low or start at a smaller scale. And that's limiting with, and I, I guess I don't want to uh, downfall PEM systems, but PEM systems can't scale their product down because they do use all those rare metals. And so we're essentially offering a product at a smaller scale where it actually meets, meets the demand in today's marketplace. Um, so I'm allowing customers to enter the market at a, at a much lower capex. And as that demand does grow, uh, we just keep adding electrolyzers. Yes, yeah, so yours provides a lot more modular, right? And what you're saying is you believe that the hydrogen production will be decentralized rather than centralized in bigger plants. Okay, this is very interesting. Uh, we'll go back to this, but there has been a challenge, guys. Rasul, Rohit, Omar, the challenge is what happens with the precious materials? How do we deal with that issue? Maybe I can take that, you know, that uh, answer first and then Rohit and Omar, please, again, chime in here. Uh, it's true that uh, we use precious metals in the design of the PEM electrolyzers, uh, but uh, please consider that this PEM electrolyzer design has been around for 60 years, six decades, and only mostly used by NASA and, and US Navy and Western navies for high oxygen production for astronauts or the crew of the nuclear submarines. So uh, there hasn't been much of performance optimization and cost reduction efforts on the technology yet. If we go back about 25 years, uh, Los Alamos National Lab in the US had the project to decrease the amount of precious metals in the PEM fuel cells, because at that time fuel cells was very important. And interestingly, our CTO, Chuck, Dr. Chuck Karupaya was part of that team and over the course of two years, the team could decrease the amount of precious metals by multiple folds. Uh, and that's 25 years ago for fuel cell. Now, the first question is that uh, we are in the beginning of the hydrogen market, and there's a huge potential for all of us in AEM, in PEM, in alkaline, to reduce the cost and optimize our product. So, the, you know, we have extreme R&D focus, every, I believe every, every company has, but in Ohmium, we also have extreme R&D focus on decreasing the amounts of precious metals. And that's from the two perspectives. One is about, you know, the availability of that metals. And the second aspect is that it has a cost reduction effects. So if you look at the availability of that metal, uh, right now, the general sense in the industry is about you can build two and a half gigawatts of electrolyzer by using one ton of the precious metals. And Johnson Matty uh, company did a great uh, white paper. I will encourage everyone to take a look at that. That's, you know, the, the concern about the availability of iridium is, is, uh, is not a valid concern. If you look at that uh, supply chain, we have about seven tons of production per year, but there's a huge amount of secondary market in iridium because iridium has been used in other industries and a lot of that is being recycled every year. And as a result, uh, no one is mentioning the amount of recycled iridium in their, uh, you know, in, in their market reports. And that can become easily available to, uh, to, you know, to the PEM industry. The second uh, item is about the recycling. As we know, whenever we replace the PEM stack, we can easily recycle that. And by the advancement that we are building in the technology, we can easily use the amount of material in one, <clears throat> in one older stack for multiple newer stacks. So please, you know, take a look at the uh, white paper Johnson Matty, you know, issued uh, about, you know, six, about five, six months ago. I can share the link for Share that. the link. Yeah, I was going to say, yes. share the link is probably the easiest thing. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, and then uh, the second item is about, of course, this is a, this is a huge R&D focus for us to also reduce the amount of, uh, you know, precious metals. As, as I mentioned, uh, it has been done in the past in the fuel cell industry. Our CTO was part of that effort. We are doing that again. Uh, in Ohmium, we are also have collaboration with multiple universities around the world to work on uh, this, you know, this item. There are uh, three or four approaches to uh, decreasing, the, um, decreasing or even eliminating the amount of precious metals used in the PEM technology. So uh, I, I would, you know, I would uh, share that, but at the end, uh, regardless of the availability, it's very important for us to also decrease the amount of these metals such that we can have a more cost-effective equipment.
Thank you very much. So but basically the, the objective is to do with the precious materials all the way and to use and recycle as many as possible. Omar Rohit, do you want to add anything? I, I just want to emphasize this, these two aspects, right? All of us in this companies are, you know, putting a lot of effort into reducing the amount of uh, uh, rare, rare metals that we're using. The amount of metal or rare, rare metals that are being used are relatively minimum. And, and the emphasis is on the aspect of recycling, right? Most of these iridium can be reco recovered at the end of life of these uh, membranes to be reutilized in, in its full. So, and, and that's, that's what, uh, I think that's what makes this PEM technology attractive. And like, like we said before, you know, there's, there's place for each of, of the different technologies, but uh, PEM doesn't necessarily pose a concern from the metal, uh, air metal perspective. Yes, you, you have a little jewel, you know, once you're done with your, with your electrolyzer, you can sell the radium back. That's, yeah. that's, that's a good perspective. Who said you, that? Was it you? Yeah, okay. So shall we go with just a couple of the questions that we had kind of like discussed in advance? One is like the, the case, the user case. Rohit, you said that there is no clear user case for one technology versus another. Um, but like when when developers come to you, you know, and they're looking and they're maybe considering, you know, what technology is for them, usually what do you see there are like sort of the common misconceptions or the things that perhaps they should understand better about, about PEM technology? I'm sending this to you. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, oh, fair enough. Sorry, I muted myself. There was some okay, apparently. Um, I don't think that there is too much of a misconception per se. Usually there's other aspects that we have to demystify for clients when they ask for hydrogen solutions. Because their perspective is actually quite clear. You know, a client is looking to get hydrogen at the cheapest cost possible. It's not usually a case that they come to us with a preference between alkaline and PEM. And there's a few challenges, of course, PEM versus alkaline. Alkaline has been around to some extent longer than PEM has. And the, the scale and level of industrialization is a little bit ahead of the PEM technology. So today, um, the, the, the cost of the PEM certainly needs some improvement. Let's put it that way. The aspects that are a little bit unclear come for more from the business development or let's say the business model side of this, right? So um, you could take two perspectives. One is that electrolyzers should always run base loads yeah so 8000 operating hours a year and that is one of the way to bring down the cost of, 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 of hydrogen in the end yeah to get the most out of the electrolyzer is also the other perspective right so there will be more renewables and integration of renewable energies into the grid which will inevitably lead to electrolyzers having to be a little bit more flexible and reacting to those markets so that's a bit of the unclarity we see going forward. And that's why I also say it will never be really one answer that solves both of those challenges. There will be cases where um, you will want to run an electrolyzer really 8,000 hours of the year. And there will be other cases where you want to be more flexible, serving the demands of the grid, serving the demands of the off taker. That's kind of the discussions that we have today. Going forward, when the PEM technology does reach a scaled level of manufacturing where the cost is much more competitive to alkaline, we see the playing field level a little bit. And we see potentially PEM stepping into some of the markets that are traditionally, let's say, being dominated by alkaline at the moment. So can't read into the crystal ball, but always we say that every technology will have its place for sure. And this is, you know, also an idea to perhaps have installations that are partly alkaline and partly PEM. Again, to take the best of both technologies, yeah? Part of your electrolysis installation running a base load while a second or, or, or perhaps a smaller part of it uh, being a bit more flexible to the reactions. So, okay. so it's a case of running the numbers and then deciding which of the options are better for you. And within PEM, just to understand, as, as a developer, are there vast differences in between manufacturers? Or are there different options, similarly bankable, similarly working in terms of the technology? You know, how far different are they between them? And I'll, I'll open this to any of you. Uh, Rasul, go on. Maybe I go first again. <laughs> so, and, and please, uh, Rohit and uh, Omar, please chime in here. So, uh, 
you know, when we look at the electrolyzer design, uh, basically there are two important aspects to that. The first aspect is the technology we select. And of course we have uh, PEM, AEM, alkaline and solid oxide as a solution. And then the second aspect is that how you we do the system design around that. Uh, of course, you know, at Omnium, our goal is to have to provide the most competitive level of cost of hydrogen or hydrogen price to the customer. And when we look at the, you know, system design, we try to kind of like uh, borrow a page from the Henry Ford's uh, uh, kind of like playbook and design a standard interlocking modular units that can, uh, that have, uh, that's our DFX base. In other words, uh, the design such, so, uh, should be such that, that it's designed for manufacturing. So we can have a very cost effective manufacturing and have provide the electrolyzer uh, at a very cost effective price. The second item is design for uh, installation. A large portion of the uh, project in initial investment might be the balance of the plan and the EPC cost. So if the design allows a rapid installation with minimum assembly at the site, uh, without the need for any building, that can expedite the, you know, the process for EPC and significantly reduce the investment cost. The third item is designed for operation and maintenance. Because if you look at LCOH, it has the initial investment, it has the operation cost, and it has the hydrogen output. So having a design which is for operation and maintenance makes the operation on O&M very inexpensive and then creates high availability for the product so that it can have a very high output. And then when we put these together, we can, have the best, we can provide the best level of cost of hydrogen. That's why if you look at Ohmium design, we have a very modular design, uh, which is kind of like between what an after is providing and which is one of the much larger electrolyzer vendors like 10 megawatt or 20 megawatt, you know, uh, electrolyzer vendors are providing. Uh, it's fully assembled at the, at the factory. So at the site, it's, it would be very easy to install those. Uh, they are uh, modular interlocking. We can, you can be, put them together as Lego pieces and you can, uh, the, many of the project developers may have concerns about the market. They don't want to start like 10 gigawatt at once. They can phase it out and build the project in phases. Uh, our approach will allow them to start smaller and expand their projects as, as the market grows. And last but not the least, all of these generation of the product that we are working from the R&D perspective are backward compatible. So the customer and the project owners would not have to be concerned about the design and the changes. They can have the same design repeated and repeated, build as the market grow. Thank you very much. So this is specific to Omnium and what you yes. guys are doing. What about you guys, uh, maybe Omar, anything specific you'd like to say? No? No, I, nothing to add. It's, you know, the, the story is uh, relatively similar. They're similar. Okay. Uh, Rohit, same for you guys, or do you want to add something? Because otherwise I'm going to ask a question for David about AEM specifically. I'll keep it then super short. Um, I agree with uh, Omi and, uh, and what Siemens are saying here. I think that everybody is looking to improve the PEM technology. The electrochemistry is the same, but there's a lot of little aspects that we improved on the product product side, let's say, and then uh, system side, integration side, solution side. And what we see on the market is a little bit what I'd say for Rolls-Royce distinguishes us is um, our solutions mentality in the sense of our portfolio that it's not just looking at hydrogen as one solution to everything. We look at batteries for solutions to certain challenges. We look at hydrogen to solutions for certain challenges. And then we're really, you know, chicken and egg is something that we hear a lot in this industry and no one can solve that individually, but Rolls-Royce is coming with the history also from the off-taker perspective. So we have engines that are running today in the rail, marine business, stationary business, turbines for the aerospace business, um, aviation business, excuse me. and we can't bridge the gap alone, but we are building a vision here of sustainability that is not just one solution for everything, but rather a mix of all those solutions, starting with the production of green hydrogen, but also really investing now in the offtake of hydrogen batteries in other cases, 
but also enabling our engines to run on e-fuel. So sustainable aviation fuel is a hot topic for us. Methanol for the marine business is a hot topic for us. And we see our electrolyzer aspect really as an enabler. And that's really what's needed. If we really talk about the emissions on a global scale, we have to decarbonize a lot, not just one or two industries. So. I see. So you're like a sort of a circled uh, answer, like the whole supply chain you're looking at. Um, Electrolyzer is just a, one of the one of the sides of it. And David, with uh, David, so there was another David, but now there is no other David. So you are our David here in this session. Uh, what about AEM? What applications are good fit for AEM? Yeah, Nothing. because we are a, a modular solution, uh, we want to build individual small building blocks. Um, anywhere from zero kilowatts all the way up to, I would say probably the threshold is 10 megawatts. Um, currently our building block right now is a 2.4 kilowatt product that produces one kilogram of hydrogen a day. And again, most customers globally are using that product as a pilot system, right? Everyone wants much larger projects in, in the future. However, most people can't get their hands on electrolyzers in general. Um, and so I'm offering these companies the ability to enter the hydrogen market at a very, very low cap, capex at a very, with a very small product. Um, that's gonna allow companies to get experience with hydrogen. Because most people I talk to, they, it's, their experience with hydrogen is limited. And so I think this is a, a initial stepping stone that everybody in North America should take to get experience with hydrogen, the different procedures of handling hydrogen, um, that experience, in my opinion, is so invaluable. And I think the problem, um, you know, from a PEM perspective, again, they, you can't scale the product down. And so they're asking people to enter the market at this higher capex. And that's, I mean, that's very difficult for these customers to do. Um, so again, yeah, the 2.4 kilowatt, the EL 4.0, it's being used for pilot projects across the entire globe. Um, as we scale up, so our next product that we'll introduce is a one megawatt system that produces 450 kilograms a day. And I think what's so unique about that product is we're simply ripping the core of our, our, our EL 4.0, which is the small 2.4 kilowatt, and replicating it 420 times. And so we, we've talked today a lot about scale and how do we lower the price of hydrogen in general? It's through economies of scale. And so as I sell that one megawatt system, it's in a 40 foot container, I'm virtually selling 420 of our stacks. Um, you know, we've had an enormous amount of uh, uh, excitement for that one megawatt system. We've quoted it out to over 400 customers globally. Um, you know, there, is, there are some customers that want a hundred of those units. And so when we talk about economies of scale and how do we lower the cost of hydrogen, it's through economies of scale. And this is how our approach to the industry is different than everybody else. I, I could virtually, um, you know, sell 42,000 um, stacks. So I want to ask. First, that's, sorry, that's pretty incredible because you, you actually sell from one stack to just, just one of those containers will have 420 stacks. Right. I mean, it's clear that like your business proposition is completely different to everything else. Like even in the sense that you guys also started with the small stacks and now you're making them modular, okay. larger as well. So, and for the for the record, I have visited a few small Sorry, projects yeah. and they all have an answer. Uh, I actually seen them, you know, they, I say they look like a microwave because they're tiny, you know, they're little boxes, so. Yeah, I always say that in my in my customer meetings. I always call it the microwave product because it really sticks in people's heads. It's the same size. It kind of looks like a microwave. Um, so yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah, I'm glad. It's like same, 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 same. Yeah, go, go, go ahead. Russell. Yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, I just wanted to mention that you know, as as David mentioned. Uh, one of the nice thing about the PEM technology, and it might be applicable to AEM, is also the size doesn't matter from the efficiency perspective. So if you look at the like gas turbines, larger gas turbines have better efficiency. But the nice thing about the at least PEM technology is that uh, the the size doesn't matter in terms of efficiency. And our, our approach has been why don't we leverage that and build it at a size e that is easy to manufacture and easy to install and maintain, as I mentioned, because at the end, we want to provide the best hydrogen price. And when we look at that, you know, we didn't want to be too small. We didn't want to be too large. 
And that's where we came up with the electrolyzer, which is kind of like at the size of a car. And why a car? If you look at the car uh, and the electrolyzer, there are a lot of uh, balance of the plant, which are similar like radiators and pumps. So going with that size would allow us to leverage the automobile part manufacturing. And what is specific about automobile part manufacturing? It's very high volume, it's very high quality, and it's very low price. So by leveraging that, we are at a size that is not too small, not too large, and could be optimized for the cost of manufacturing, and also for the cost of scaling the manufacturing. Because if you look at that, the automobile industry is all, all around the world. They are at a very good scale. So it would be easy for us to also scale as the market and the demand for the customer is growing. Uh, I also wanted to mention that, you know, since you mentioned you have, you have seen the adapter, uh, I would like to also invite you to visit our factory. We have a factory in India. We have, the, uh, we have a lab in the US. And we are now, as we speak, executing on seven projects. Most of these projects are with customers with very large uh, goals and targets. But as David mentioned, most customers would like to start with a pilot. So we are executing at a pilot at 300 or 400 kW, which is you know, a good, good size to start between 300 kW and one and a half megawatts. Uh, so, and the cost, most customers would love to expand that to a few gigawatts, but of course they would like to start small, learn about the hydrogen electrolyzers and expand that as the market grow. Excellent, thank you very much. I love visiting all these projects. You know, I find that they come alive. So thank you very much. And I would go to also the Rolls Royce and the Siemens projects and want to see them also. You know, in time, the invitations roll, I'll be there right there. Omar, do you want to say something? Uh, just real quick, you know, in the, in the last two discussions we just had between Rasul and David, this is where you start seeing the different approaches from each of the manufacturers, each of the OEMs, right? We, we all have a different approach to the stack production and, and, and we all have a different approach also to the scale, right? So Siemens Energy is focusing on large scale electrolysis or hydrogen production, right? Where, where you see the sizes, our electrolyzer full array system starts at consuming 17.5 megawatts of electricity and producing about 335 kilograms an hour of hydrogen. And, and instead of, of being, you know, containerized in a solution, right, we, we focus on adapting it to each of the needs of, of the specific large scale uh, projects. And this is where you start seeing the differences as to how we are approaching uh, the manufacturing of the electrolyzers in each of the companies, but also how are we tackling the market, right? And our approach to different segments of the market. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and Glenn, maybe I can add yeah. one, uh, one add comments is like, you know, as, as uh, Omar mentioned perfectly, there are different approach and uh, those are well suited for different sizes of projects. Uh, you know, if I go back to maybe 20 years ago in the uh, computer industry, everyone talked about mainframe computers for, uh, you know, data centers. But nowadays, most of the people are relying on the blade servers. Uh, you see these big giant data server, data rooms with all of these uh, small servers. We also see this, saw the same in the battery industry. Uh, I, I worked in the renewable energy industry for two decades. So uh, we see now people put together modular units to build large or a small scale projects. And also we, we have seen that in the PV inverter industry. I remember in 2011, we thought the larger inverters are better. Where the inverters were at the size of 200 kW. So we tried to get to something like few megawatts, but around 2015, 2016, we realized that the larger is better, but the modular larger is much better. And that's where now we have five megawatt inverters, but when you open the inverter, it's something like eight or seven or six modules put together, each about 500, megawatt, 500 kW to build a few megawatt inverter. So that has been our approach to be able, Omium approach to be able to serve uh, small and large scale projects because we believe that uh, as David mentioned, there's a very good chance like refueling stations, uh, having uh, projects very close to the customer 
for distributed generation of hydrogen. And as Omar mentioned, there's huge, huge room for projects serving the steel industry and cement industry and refineries and ammonia where they are, it's kind of like hard to abate uh, industries. Thank you very much, Rasul. As it happens, string inverters and central inverters now are about 50-50, more or less, in deployment. Um, David, go right ahead. You want to say something? Yeah, and I was actually going to say exactly what Rasul just commented on. Um, you know, our technology allows us to take a modular approach. And if you look at any successful technology industry ever created in, in the history of this world, right? You look at computers, we started off with this huge supercomputer. Eventually we got desktops to laptops to what you see in the data center, like Russ Will said, we're taking the same approach with the electrolyzers. Um, same thing with the solar industry, right? If you have a hundred megawatt solar farm, it's really 100 watt individual smaller panels that are just being multiplied multiple times. This is how you lower the cost of hydrogen. And that's exactly the approach that we're taking. And Glenn, I, I saw some questions. Uh, can we answer yeah. those questions or? Yes, let's go and answer those questions. I was going to say, because we don't have a lot of time. So, uh, and I was going to ask you about timelines and bottlenecks, but maybe, you know, at the end, you can add something to it. Or how are you doing in terms of delivery times? Because these are important questions. We will run out of time. This has been so quick. You know, guys, I wish we had another two hours with you. Which of the questions did you want to answer? The, Omar, you have answered some by text, but um, I have one here. Um, which OEMs have the best warranties to cover electrolyzer lifetime degradation? Is it a priority to OEMs to be able to warranty percentage to, of nominal capacity after 10 years or 25 years? So what kind of warranties do you offer? Yes, yeah, so uh, I wanted to answer that question from a different perspective. We, we heard the same concern from many customers over the last three years. And what we did is that we came up with a business model where we work with the customer as the remote monitoring and maintenance partner. We are not doing the operation. The customer will be in full charge of operating their projects, but we will be there as a partner to manage all the stack replacement, power electronic replacement, and all of the repairs required for the electrolyzer to have a great performance with some standard performance defined contractually. As a result of that, it's kind of like a 25 year or life project lifetime uh, guarantee that is paid every year rather than upfront. And we find it very you know, interesting for, the, for our customer to go with that model. Anyone else want to add anything to this? Yeah, go on, David. Yeah, we offer a one year warranty. If you connect to our energy management system, um, you'll get an extra one year, and that's on these smaller devices. It's still being talked about as far as warranty on the, the bigger multi, um, one megawatt multi-core. But for now, it's one year. If you connect to our EMS, it's, it's two years in full. So if you connect to the EMS, it's different. What about Omar, Rohit? And so I think the approach, it's all about the, the service approach that we have, right? So it's similar to what Rasul, Rasul just mentioned. As, as we develop the opportunity and we understand the, the project in itself, we can develop in a specific service concept that is associated with uh, you know, being able to keep certain hydrogen production throughout a, a lifetime of the plant, right? And that's, uh, that, that, that's what the concept is. And, and as, as the technology and as the industry matures, right, we will eventually see the, the guarantees that the customers are expecting, which is, the similar to what they have seen in other industries, right? They, they want the asset to be guaranteed for the lifetime. I would only reiterate that really. And this comes back to the discussion of where we position ourselves for what application. So I'll throw this in there. Our modular size is between three to four megawatts. Yeah. So everyone has chosen a different size, so to speak, and everyone will have their space in their areas. Now regarding service maintenance, I mean, when we talk about P2X, we're not really talking about a few containers, we are talking about massive industrial complexes yeah, on the electrolysis side, on the fuel synthesis side, on the carbon capture side. And they would really, it, it, it becomes more plant design than product design. And you're talking about plants that need to survive for 20 to 40 years and so on, because you have offtake agreements with, let's say, for example, 
aviation business who just needs their fuel annually, monthly, whatever it is, and the guarantees that these fuels will be available for the next 20, 40. That's a bit the project developer perspective, right? You secure your technology, but you have to secure your offtake agreements for very long periods before the payback really comes. Wow. So that's the direction we go in as well. Um, we, we have, I would like to say, a, a good of a head start. So Rolls-Royce in different forms has been around for a very long time. We have subsidiaries and a network that really spans the globe, um, which will be enabled and utilized, let's say now, to, to, to understand the service maintenance that comes with sustainable technologies, hydrogen batteries, whatever else it may be. So we have to build on what we have, but uh, we have quite a bit in place already. Thank you very much. Uh, can I do like a couple of rapid fire questions? This means rapid fire answers. Okay, one of them is about bottlenecks and delivery times. It is, everyone talks about how, you know, there is issues with this. So how are you resolving this? By when is it going to be resolved? So who wants to take it? Quick fire yeah, answer, I, I David, guess I go. Can, yeah, I can start. So for us, we're, we're not dealing with these rare metals, right? So that EL 4.0 or the, micro, the microwave product could be delivered within 30 to 60 days. Um, I would say the biggest bottleneck from our perspective is just a lack of competency of system integrators in the United States and Canada. You know, you view the electrolyzer, right, as the, the beating heart of a much larger system, right? You need to compress that hydrogen. You need to store it. You need to run it through a fuel cell. You need to dispense it into a vehicle. I sell 95% of my electrolyzers to systems integrators that can connect all these systems together and actually sell a product that somebody can use, right? And so there's this huge gap in my mind in the marketplace of competent system integrators that can connect all these systems and create a, a, a whole product that someone can use. So I would say from our perspective, the biggest bottleneck is not a delivery problem. It's more of a competency of finding the yeah. right companies to integrate. <laughs> I believe there was a very good conversation in the previous panel about that. As Rohit mentioned, the project development cycle includes a lot of permitting and interconnection and then project financing. And we have seen that uh, in terms of uh, hydrogen projects, the interconnection and permitting globally is a bottleneck for uh, many projects, specifically in, in Europe and in the US. Uh, that being said, there are very good efforts also on the government side to expedite those, uh, as, as an example, uh, Europe is working on that to expedite the permitting process for green hydrogen projects. And also in the US, uh, there are efforts going on. Okay, if we keep going this way, this is gonna be amazing. Omar, what about you guys? Yeah, you? The last, so the last, the, the one thing that we haven't discussed, right? We've been talking a lot about the stacks and the electrolyzers in itself, um, but we haven't covered much about the, the entire supply chain to make this happen. And the electrolyzers, particularly when we would talk about large scale, we're also talking about the need for uh, things such as transformers and rectifiers for these electrolyzer stacks. And, and, and that today is a bottleneck, right? So the, 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 the lead times that we're seeing on that electrical equipment is significantly large and it can pose, pose a challenge. So I think the, 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 the way we are approaching this is, we're trying to find the partner, the right partnerships across the value chain, right? As we partner with project developers and, and off takers, and at the same time, we're also doing such with the with our supply chain to make sure there's enough uh, supply for the projects that we're uh, going after. Thank you very much. And just the final question, and then we'll leave it at here. And thank you very much, guys. Uh, it's about the O&M considerations. Um, what should project developers or people that are looking now at electrolyzers consider? And please be short because we don't have a lot of time. Razul, I know that you want to start. Rohit, sure. Rohit mentioned a very good note uh, that the, you know the long long term production at the good efficiency and uh, with the good availability for the project is extremely important because at the end of the day, the hydrogen offtake agreement is extremely important for any project. So any, uh, in terms of uh, O&M, uh, that's why, you know, Omnium is providing the O&M as a uh, remote monitoring and maintenance, I should say, not operation as a, as a service to our customer to make sure that uh, their project will be successful, not just in the beginning, but also for the life of the project. 
I'll keep it super quick. There's so many, so many things to consider. I'll tell you the first one that I just woke up this morning and had to consider. So regulations is the thing for me today. It's um, very hard to develop projects if the regulations are not super clear. You can develop projects if you have bad regulations, but if you have just unclear regulations, there is no incentive for people to step in and finance projects. So that's changing with the IRA bill. Um, hopefully also in Europe, it will become more clear in the next weeks and months, and that will help a lot to push all of us forward. I feel we need another webinar just for that. <laughs> because it is a can of worms, I tell you. The, the sure. good news. Yeah, the good news is that you know we had the release of ISO 22734 on the technical side about a month ago that will uh, you know help a lot in terms of defining at least the technical requirements for hydrogen projects excellent so omar and david do you want to add anything are you good as much as i could add i i, I think we're running out of time so we'll, we'll leave Fair it like enough. That. yes david same yeah let's yes move okay on. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Rasul. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, David. And thank you, Rohit, for being here with us today. We will do more of this. We'll see you back again. But for now, we say goodbye to you because this technology panel now uh, is finished and we're going to move on to R&D. And you're going to hear all about, you know, the new R&D um, initiatives uh, all over the world, really a little bit of everything we have in here. And also one of the first things that we're going to hear is about uh, the, the stuff that the Unreal, you know, and the H2U was working on. So hopefully you'll be able to, to hear about all these people. Right now, what my colleagues are doing is they're bringing in the new speakers. So uh, literally we will begin within uh, just uh, one minute, but if you wanna take, uh, go for coffee break, I know that you guys started earlier and we still have this session and then a very short session thereafter, then, um, then you can do so, but we will we will not stop. This is going to be a very, very small uh, switched over because um, I can already see that the speakers are coming here. But now we're going to be looking into the kind of the future. You know, what does it look like in terms of the new technologies that are being developed? As you know, the DOE has a lot of electrolyzer programs out there to try and reduce the the price. They're trying to make sure that more of it gets manufactured to understand the efficiencies better, to understand uh, better uh, how to uh, properly operate and maintain them. Um, and this is uh, a little bit of what we will be talking about today. We have some very interesting um, technologists here with us today. So let me start then. Rangachari, welcome. Or uh, would you like me to call you differently? Yeah, just go by Mukun, which is fine. Mukun, perfect. Well, Mukun, welcome. And what we, you, you're actually going to give us like the story of HT News, what you are working on uh, to, at the R&D level with the Unreal and also the, the, the LBNL. Uh, then we're going to be hearing from Nell as well and all of the new stuff that they're working on, H2 Pro, which is a company, both companies we've heard from before. And then we have some new uh, companies looking into new areas as well with Tiwer and Sener. So welcome, everyone. Do we have everyone here? I yes. think so. Yes, welcome, welcome everyone. <laughs> and, you know, welcome, Nora. You're the second woman in this panel with me. There'll be yes. another one. We're talking about backability, but there is not a lot of women working in electrolyzers as it happens. So let's make this, uh, this, this session is going to be short presentations, uh, about six minutes or so, and then we'll take some questions at the end. It's really simple. So the first person is going to be Mukun. So Mukun, if you want to, actually, let's start with some really quick introduction. So uh, Mukun, can you introduce yourself and what yeah, you're working um, on? I'm a senior scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So uh, I'm here to present some stuff with our uh, H2NU consortium. So this is a consortium of several labs. It's a DOE consortium. So I'll uh, introduce the consortium and present some data on that later in the panel discussion today. Thank you very much, uh, Mukun. Next, I'd like to ask uh, Sergio, please, if you can introduce yourself shortly. Yes, my name is Sergio Perez Bakovic, and I'm uh, representing Nell here. I'm a chemical engineer at Nell. Thank you very much, and some of the work that you guys are doing at Nell, perfect. Next, Ignacio, please, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, uh, good afternoon, I guess, for most of uh, us here in the call. I'm Ignacio Vincas. I'm head of North America for H2 Pro, and I'll tell you more about it in the presentation. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, Marco, if you could introduce yourself. Sure. 
Hello, and thank you to all the people that is uh, assisting to this workshop. I'm Marco Carrascosa, and the CEO of Keyword and also the CEO of uh, Hisan. It is an uh, uh, initiative to produce uh, renewable hydrogen with uh, different technology, with photocatalysis. Photocatalysis, looking forward to hear. Thank you, Marco. And next, Nora, Marco. please, if you can introduce yourself. Thank you, Belen, yes. My name is Nora Castañeda, and I am the Hydrogen Business Director at Cener Energy. Cener is a family-owned engineering and technology company uh, based in Spain, founded more than 60 years ago. And in, in Cener Energy, we are focused on supporting our clients by designing and executing innovative solutions toward the energy transition. Excellent. So now that we all know each other, uh, please, uh, Mukund, if you can start sharing your presentation. And for everyone else, we work the same way. We will have a short amount of time because this session is designed to be about 45 minutes. So uh, after the presentations, as you can see, they're very short presentations. So we should get through them pretty quickly, even though there is a few of them. And you'll hear about all of these new technologies and we'll be taking questions thereafter. So go right ahead, Mukund. Can you see my presentation? I can, and I can hear you, so go okay. for it. Okay, I'm here to talk about the H2 new consortium. So some electrolysis R&D on this consortium. So I'm Mukund from Lawrence Berkeley. Okay, so the, the H2 new consortium was started in 2020 by the DOE. So it's a comprehensive effort uh, to try to get the cost of hydrogen from electrolysis to less than $2 a kilogram. So we're looking at three different technologies, PEM, solid oxide, and liquid alkaline. So originally the consortium started with just PEM and solid oxide. This year, the consortium was expanded to a larger budget and we're starting uh, to look at liquid alkaline R&D to try and improve uh, the, the technology. So the consortium is made up of several core uh, laboratories uh, that are listed here. And uh, university and industry partners are being added to them. So we currently have three university partners. And there's actually a, a funding opportunity announcement by DOE where they're looking for a lot of uh, proposals to add more members to this to work with our core national lab team. So there is a proposal called out there. So within the National Lab system, what we are trying to do is try to utilize a combination of experimental, analytical, and modeling tools to improve these electrolyzer technologies. What we are going after is durability, performance, and scale up. So we're not, uh, materials development is not the focus of this consortium, but given the materials, we're looking at to improve the durability, performance, and scale up and understand them better. So in today's talk, I'll uh, give you just a brief outline. So even though we do a lot of these technologies, given the short time, I just wanted to concentrate on a couple of things. So I'll just give you some uh, recent work that we're doing on the R&D of uh, PEM electrolysis, some iridium dissolution data that I'll provide, and also some uh, porous transport layer um, uh, data that I'll provide. So these two reason I chose this was even in the last panel, we heard a lot of stuff about iridium thrifting. So these two will be very crucial for trying to get that precious metal uh, problem under control. So, uh, if, so we have a different structure for this on the high temperature side and the on a, and on the low temperature side. On the low temperature side, the I'm, which I work on, it's organized in the following way. So it's led by Brian Pivovar out of Enderal and Debbie Myers from Argonne and myself from Berkeley uh, lead different areas of this uh, low temperature effort. And we have people from Enderal, Oak Ridge and Argonne uh, and uh, Berkeley leading <coughs> various tasks under these two areas. Yes. So that's the outline of H2 new. So in the next few minutes, so let me just talk about the get to the next slide. Okay. So let me talk about the two things that I was uh, uh, promised to talk about. So the first one is iridium. So in, a, in order to, since iridium is one of the most expensive components, you want to make sure what you put in there is effectively used and lasts a long time. So what we have noticed is if you look at the iridium, so the, it's, it's important to understand fundamentally what happens to the iridium. So whenever you cycle the voltages, what we find is in external cells, the iridium essentially dissolves. The amount of iridium that dissolves uh, it depends upon the potential and the potential step sizes that you put. So we have uh, done a lot of fundamental work on this and the iridium, iridium dissolution and developed a model to try to quantify how the iridium dissolves and how it's dependent on these potentials. 
So all of that will be very important to try to use as little as iridium as possible and keep the electrolyzer performance as high as possible for the longest time possible, okay? So again, all of this work is very fundamental work that will have implications on how you design your electrolyzer. And then uh, here is an example of what, what happens with some of the iridium and some of its practical implications. What we find is that there are various iridium uh, transitions from iridium metal to iridium 3 plus and then different oxi oxidation states. So we find that these dissolution rates are very correlated to some of these oxidation state changes that we see. So the amount of iridium that dissolves really depends upon the rate at which you run this potential. So what we found was the maximum dissolution you get is when we start from very low potential where we have basically iridium metal and take it all the way up to iridium oxide. So by controlling all of this, we can try to come up with uh, ways to uh, operate the electrolyzer in order to minimize this iridium uh, degradation. So that's some of the key work that we're doing on the durability of the iridium site. So the other part we're doing is how do you practically implement all these things in a practical system, right? So we teamed up with Carnegie Mellon University and came up with some reference electrode uh, experiments where we can try to figure out uh, how to prevent this iridium from going to iridium pure metal and then going back to oxide. So if you prevent that, then you can, the iridium lasts much longer. So one of the ways is to separately measure the anode and cathode potential. So we have ways to do that. And we have come up with them to shut down and start up strategies with different purging that can keep the anode potential high. So that means that the iridium is always in the iridium oxide state and it will last a long time in your application. So now I want to move on to the last area. So where we're essentially, once you put the iridium, what you want to do is get the maximum performance out of it, right? So the, that way you can use less iridium in your material. So it will not only last a long time, but you can get high current densities, which means high uh, hydrogen uh, output out of it. So one of the things that we noticed was the porous transport layer, the way it touches the iridium. So this is where the water comes in and the hydrogen, uh, the oxygen evolution happens. So the oxygen goes out on the iridium side. So if we change the surface of that material by laser ablation, we can get better contact and we can get better performance of those materials. So what that does is given the same amount of iridium, so the amount of voltage it takes to produce the same amount of hydrogen, so the amount of power uh, to produce the same amount of uh, hydrogen can be really decreased by improving the uh, material that we use in the porous transport layer. And then this is my last slide. The other thing I want to mention is the way the porous transport layer works is the way it touches the iridium. The porous transport layer is mainly made of titanium, so it has the tendency to oxidize the surface, so that can create insulating layers. So most porous transport layers are coated with platinum. Again, that's a precious metal you want to minimize. So what we have found, uh, done some work uh, where we have noticed that the way you coat it uh, depends upon... Uh, but it has a big implication on how the performance happens. So no, uncoated materials have huge resistances and very bad performances. But once you coat it on the catalyst layer side, then you really decrease the improve the performance, decrease the voltage, and you get much be better resistances. So we're doing better understanding of these materials in order to compare a better engineer those interfaces to get the most out of a lot of the electrolyzer. So this is just a sampling of the work on the PEM side, but we also, like I said, work on the liquid alkaline side that has recently started, and we have an extensive effort on the solid oxide side where we do R&D in order to improve the performance, durability, uh, and, the, and lower the cost of these electrolysis systems. So that's all I have. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Mukun. Just one quick question for you. Um, are you looking for any uh, partnering from companies in the industry? And if so, you know, are there options to work with you more closely in this research? And if so, what are they? Just so that everybody knows in the in the audience. Uh, definitely. The national labs are always looking for partners. So one of the easiest ways is there is currently a funding opportunity announcement uh, by the uh, DOE that's been released. And you can apply to that funding opportunity announcement. And in the call, it specifically says that you'll be working closely with the H2 new labs if you're doing electrolysis research. The other way would be to just reach out to us independently and we can set up individual agreements with the labs to work with you on specific problems. 
So either through the consortium, through DOE funded projects or one-on-one -on -one approach to the labs, we have various mechanisms to work with industry on any of your research needs. Thank you very much, Mukun. Uh, I'm going to ask you to stop sharing now. And there is a couple of questions for you that I was allowed, I was wondering whether you would mind answering by text because they're quite specific. And then we'll take some more general questions at the end. Thank you okay. very much. Okay, next I'd like to ask Sergio, please, if you can share your screen and uh, deliver your presentation. As you can see, guys, in the audience, we are going really quickly. <laughs> so can we're going as my, promised. My screen yes. right now? I can see there is, oh uh, yeah, now, perfect. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the invitation to this workshop. I'm here in a uh, representation of Nell Hydrogen and my name is Sergio Perez Bakovic. Uh, just put here a couple of slides to introduce uh, um, Nell for the audience. Uh, of course, everybody has seen a slide uh, that's deck that starts with a slide like this. But really here, the main uh, point that I want to make is that the electrolyzer cost CapEx and OPEX uh, needs to be reduced to make this happen. In order for us to use hydrogen um, in many different industries, we need both the CapEx and the OPEX to be reduced. So uh, just a little bit of history about NEL. NEL hydrogen is composed of three divisions, the alkaline division um, on the top, the middle is the fueling uh, division, and on the bottom is uh, the PEM division. The PEM division is the one that I am a part of here in Wallingford, Connecticut. Uh, Nell Hydrogen a, was, has acquired a, the fueling division in uh, 2015 and a proton onsite the PEM division in 2017. Um, so now it currently is composed of these three divisions. And as you can see, uh, we've been making electrolyzers uh, for a long time um, in part uh, and been involved in hydrogen uh, for many years. Uh, we offer two uh, commercial technologies, uh, alkaline and PEM technology. As you can see, both of these have their uh, own benefits. Uh, depending on the application. Here I put uh, pictures of uh, different stacks that we have and to show the comparison between these two technologies. Uh, alkaline, of course, they uh, require a larger area. So you can see a one megawatt stack uh, requires around uh, 20 uh, meters um, cubed, um, whereas a one megawatt uh, PEM stack can be around half a, a meter cubed. So, uh, these are not only uh, stacks and systems uh, that we test in the lab, but these are actually stacks and systems that we have uh, currently out in the field. I got put here two of the examples that we have, uh, one with Everfuel, where this is currently uh, operational plant with alkaline. Uh, it's a 20 megawatt plant where wind is used to convert uh, to produce hydrogen. And this is used uh, for the end goal of mobility and refining. And the, on the right side, you can see an example of our PEM technology being used. This is also a 10 megawatt PEM system in Ibitrola, Spain. Uh, this uses solar energy uh, to convert it to hydrogen through our uh, PEM technology. And it's uh, used for the production of ammonia. To uh, touch a little bit on the R&D and innovation, uh, two of the uh, critical uh, cell components uh, are the MEA and the pores transport layer, as previously mentioned. So a lot of innovation needs to be um, uh, put into these uh, two components. Um, automation of manufacturing is a key uh, driving force to reduce uh, the cost uh, as labor is, is um, a huge um, part of that. Uh, this also uh, allows a more uniform and to be able to decrease the lower lowering of the catalyst, uh, which in turn results to a higher uh, production of uh, stacks. A, another component that is critical is a pore transfer layer, as uh, Makun was just mentioning earlier. Uh, this is a critical uh, component uh, that allows the iridium to be um, active or the catalyst at your um, a, a anode. 
So improvements on the structure and interface are critical here to allow lower loadings um, and thinner membranes to be used for, for PEM stacks. I uh, just want to sh uh, share also a couple of uh, information about our expansion and capabilities right now from Nell. Uh, Nell uh, is expanding its uh, second line in Heroia and, um, to get to the end goal of uh, two gigawatts in Heroia. Uh, we've also announced the expansion of the facility in Wallenford to uh, reach uh, 500 megawatts. Um, but we're also currently in the final stages for def defining um, our new uh, gigafactory in the uh, in the United States. Um, the decision of that should come shortly, so stay tuned. And uh, very happy to also announce a partnership. We were just talking about partnerships earlier uh, about a. a joint a, a development agreement that we've signed with uh, GM to accelerate the development of PEM technology. And here is uh, we're trying to leverage the, the uh, um, history and uh, knowledge from both uh, companies, uh, GM and Nell, to increase uh, the production and develop a new um, uh, technology for PEM. With this, just uh, to finish key takeaways, uh, the electro electrolysis cost is still tied to the development and you, there's a lot of area for improvement. Uh, the low, um, it's also critical to uh, a, see that the, uh, and consider the OPEX, so the total ownership, uh, which is uh, tied to the low cost of renewable energy. And then uh, so there's also significant uh, improvement that can be uh, obtained uh, by uh, R&D and innovations to reduce the cost of stacks in uh, the systems through the CapEx. With that, I'll just uh, end up here and open it up for the next speaker. Thank you very much, Sergio. Very interesting to see you know, what you guys are working on at NEL. Um, Continuing on, let me see who was the, this, the next presentation. I can't remember now. Uh, let me see. Uh, Ignacio, Ignacio, you are next. So if you want to share your screen. And yes. I think there's one more question here. Yeah, there is a question for you, Sergio. If you can answer it by text, I would appreciate it. Go go right ahead, Ignacio. Okay. Uh, well, so as I said, I'm Ignacio Vincas uh, with H2 Pro. And let's see this one. So we are uh, a young company uh, developing a breakthrough technology. And sometimes I start by saying, we're not PEM, uh, we're not alkaline, we're not AEM. I say, oh, you're solid oxide. No, we're not that either. We are our own kind of uh, electrolysis. So, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. The company was established in 2019. We now have over hundred employees. Uh, we're starting with first megawatt scale pilot later this year. Uh, we have the first factory under lease and in design phase. And you can see there the investors we have over, we've raised over 100 million so far. So this is, of course, traditional uh, technologies. There, there's a membrane. Um, there's a large power loss of about 30% or, or more due to the overpotential uh, in the oxygen evolution reaction. Uh, there's also membrane deg degradation, and I'll show you in a moment how we get around this. Uh, then you end up with uh, with capex and opex uh, that uh, that we don't have, uh, and it limits the pressure also because of the, the membrane. So, how is this different? Well, um, the hydrogen generation is uh, with a regular cathode uh, like electrolysis. Um, However, at ambient temperature, we are in the anode not having the upper potential. We work at lower voltages and we're oxidizing the nickel hydroxide to nickel oxy hydroxide. So in this stage, we're not releasing oxygen. Then uh, we cut the power to the system and we bring a hot electrolyte into uh, the cell pack. And uh, without uh, electricity circulation, the uh, nickel oxy hydroxide on the surface of the anode will reduce back to nickel hydroxide and release oxygen. Um, so we're alternating between phase one and phase two, uh, back and forth. What will this do? Um, this allows us, without that overpotential, 
inefficiency that generates heat, uh, we can get to 95% efficiency. So uh, on the systems for planning, uh, larger systems will be under 42 kilowatt hour per kilogram of hydrogen. There will be no membrane. We simply go to one separator uh, in, um, in the in step one hydrogen phase, and then we go to another liquid gas separator for the uh, step two when we generate oxygen. Uh, this allows us to afford lower current densities. Um, and then we are expecting our systems to be under uh, $200 per kilowatt uh, because they're simpler design, low cost materials. Uh, further advantages, we uh, not having a membrane, we are designing the systems for 45 bar. Um, it's a safer design because we, we really pipe with a three-way valve, the oxygen and the hydrogen into two different vessels. We are very much compatible with um, yeah, intermittent uh, renewable energy because our process is intermittent in itself. And keep in mind that we have several cell packs running at the same time, right? So we'll have some making hydrogen, some making oxygen and switching back and forth. So as a system overall, we're of course making hydrogen and oxygen at all times. Um, and a big thing, we, we don't have any heat removal equipment in our system design. So we have already run these prototype pilots of one and 10 kilograms a day. Uh, and uh, we continue to uh, make this bigger. And like I said earlier, our uh, megawatt scale pilot, 0.4 megawatt system will be running the second half of this year uh, in the Haifa refinery in Israel. Um, and it will consist of, uh, uh, <clears throat> of a skid with the cell packs, uh, a rectifier module, and a balance of plants. So this will be our first modular system, uh, which kind of mimics the uh, commercial systems for planning. Uh, so I guess I made it on time. Good. That was Thank you very much, Ignacio. So your pitch, no, P no PEM, no alkaline, no AM. No, sorry. We are, I forgot to say, so it said it there if you read it, it were ETAC. Uh, ETAC. So that, that is the, the name of the technology, electrochemical, uh, thermally activated chemistry. So those for, for the two steps, right? The first and the second. It, it's a mouthful, but I will learn it because it sounds really interesting. Just and ETAC. I know that uh, yeah, ETAC is easier. Yeah, I also know that, 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 you, that you guys, H2Pro, certainly having at the moment a lot of, you know, Everyone is talking about you guys and, and what you're bringing in. So that's very interesting. I think you're one of the, the big ones to watch. Uh, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Will, uh, I don't know, there is a question there that might be for you. Yes. So maybe we go answering that. And in the meanwhile, I'll open up for Marco, who is the next one on. Hi, hello. Can you hear this me? Is another, yes, we can hear you. And this is another technology that is really interesting. Go oh. right ahead. Perfect. I will try to share my screen. Photocatalysis. Now, see, that's easier. <laughs> Less of a mouthful. One moment, I will try to share with this. If, if you... Actually, Ignatius, it happens. You're a popular person. Like you got a few questions. This is a good point. If you want to answer it live, we can we do, do it thereafter. I'll start answering here and then. You let me know if you want me to. Marco, should I give you one minute and maybe ask a question from Ignacio? Yes, you... sure. I will try yeah. to, to share in that. Yeah, right. please. Uh, Wakas asks, Ignacio, how safe are membrane membraneless configurations? Uh, have you seen natural crossovers on the membrane as low as 0 0.003 grams? Mm. Yes, or I don't know. Per, per second, I guess. Per one second, OK. Uh, so For yeah, I, I can address this. Uh, uh, but then, so essentially, we are not making uh, oxygen and hydrogen at the same time. So the, the crossover uh, is really not a concern. We're making hydrogen in step one, and uh, we're actually flowing with the ele uh, electrolyte at ambient temperature into a vessel that's a liquid gas separator that will separate the electrolyte that comes back to the system and the hydrogen that's produced. Then. Um, we, we switch, of course, we have a wash step to degas the, uh, the system, and then we make oxygen when the anode 
discharges. The anode charges like a battery and then it's discharging. So um, I see that, uh, that Marco is sharing his screen. I think that's uh, the short uh, Have you answered the questions though? Yeah? Uh, so I, I think so. So then we, we go to a different separator. So we're not making it at the same time. Uh, they, they are physically piped with a three-way valve to one place or another. Yeah. Uh, so the, the crossover is not an issue for us. Uh, Mukun, yes, if you can share the link to the DOE announcement, that'd be great. And Marco, now we have your presentation, so why don't you go for it? We can hear you. Thank you very much, Ignacio. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all, everything, uh, everyone that is uh, taking this time to see this new technology. Okay, uh, High Sun Energy is a joint venture, is a, is a project that uh, is a co new company that is uh, created by Tiwer and Nanolab. Tiwer is a expert in uh, engineering development and concentrated solar technology. And Nanogab is a, a startup of the University of uh, Santiago de Compostela. It is expert in the development of the new, new materials. We combined two technologies uh, to create 100% uh, renewable and uh, hydrogen. We are in this, uh, in this project combining the uh, CST, concentrated solar uh, technology with a unique, unique uh, new material that is developed by Nanogap and we call uh, we call atomic quantum cluster is like a, like a metal molecule that uh, we combine with a, with a, a semiconductor to create a innovative catalytic material. With this that we really made is uh, create uh, uh, hydrogen that is 100% clean and renewable is of brief technology. It's based in a photocatalytic process. That is to say, we are not using electricity to produce uh, the hydrogen. It is uh, modular. It's a modular uh, system because we can go to a, a plan equivalent to one megawatt uh, if we are talking about equivalents in, in electrolyzers or up to 200 megawatts. The, one of the uh, main uh, innovations is that this very unit uh, catalytic material is able to uh, absorb more or less the uh, mainly the old uh, sunlight spectrum up to 1000 nanometers and with this we are able to have a very high efficiency in that case up to 42 solar to hydrogen efficiency compared with the normal efficiency of a uh, combination of electrolyzer plus pv that is around 11 12 percent no? Uh, as you will see with this, uh, depending on the size of the plan, we are able to produce hydrogen from 1 to 2.5 euro per kilogram. The specific very, this, this very unique and disruptive uh, material is composed by a semiconductor like uh, titanium oxide or therium oxide plus the EQCs. The EQCs is a, a small metallic molecule this uh, molecule is uh, sub nanometer size and is compound by a, a discrete number of uh, atoms. In that case, we use normally three, five, or seven atoms in this metallic molecule. These five atoms are, um, are linked to the uh, semiconductor, to the titanium oxide, to create the new material. And is this combination? the new catalytic material that make us uh, able to absorb the more energetic area of the solar spectrum. Really, the process is a catalytic process where we take the uh, H2. This uh, is important that the H2 it must not be a very pure H2. It's water that uh, is not uh, in a high level of purity. So normal, not demineralized water. And with the help of the solar light that we concentrate in a concentrator, in a solar concentrator, and the action of the catalytic material, we create, uh, we separate the, the molecule and we create oxygen and hydrogen. Just the process is something like this. We first, we create uh, a steam 
in the right temperature and pressure. This thing was uh, done with the concentrated solar technology. And this thing go into a reactor that has the catalytic material. And we put in contact this thing with the catalytic material and the light, concentrated light. At the end, we create a mixture that has steam, oxygen, and hydrogen. And we go to a separation process where we separate firstly the oxygen and then the hydrogen and the water that is finally condensated. If you look at more or less how could be how is the system, this is a picture of the of the of the design with a equivalent production of one megawatt of electrolyzer. That is to say around 18 kilograms per hour. Um, in the first area of this design, we are using the concentrated solar power to, gen to create the steam. And then the second part of the system, this steam go into a uh, concentrated area that use a, a multi-tubular uh, reactor where the, the reaction occur. At the end of this uh, multi-tubular uh, reactor, we have a mixture of steam, oxygen, and hydrogen. If we make a quick comparison uh, with an electrolyzer, with a one, me one megawatt electrolyzer that is taking the electricity coming from a PV plant, we can see as uh, due to the efficiency of the system, we use more or less seven times less uh, space than the uh, electrolyzer plus the PV, that is to say around 2.6 2. Uh, uh, square thousand, sorry, uh, 2,600 square meter compared with the 20,000 square meter. And in a serial production, the capes of our design and the opus of our design today is almost half compared with the PV plus electrolyzer. If we are talking of the modularity, we are able to uh, sell the hydrogen in our own one euro per uh, kilogram. If we are talking of a big plan, big plan is an equivalent plan of 200 megawatts. That is to say a plan that are able to produce 9,000 tons of hydrogen per year. And if we are talking of a small plants, like a plan of uh, 45, 45 tons per year, we are talking of a, we are talking of a price that we are able to achieve in between two to 2.5 euro per kilogram. Where we are in the project, now we have uh, uh, done the, lab, uh, the testing in a lab re, uh, reactor, in laboratory reactor. Conceptual design was done. In the next month, we are uh, working for the uh, field reactor. We will install a field reactor with, uh, with natural sun, concentrated sunlight. And uh, then, uh, after this, we are planning to install a one, mega, one megawatt equivalent plant, that is to say a pilot plant that are able to produce 18 kilograms per hour uh, with, uh, with this uh, technology. Making a summary, this is a no, view, no doubt that is 100% clean hydrogen and renewable everything. We, we don't use electricity. We are not, con uh, we are not uh, coupling to the price of the electricity in in our cost for production. That is something that is uh, very important for us. Independent of the price of the electricity, the production cost that we uh, have is uh, constant. Uh, we only use the water and, and the sun, and we are able to achieve in a big plants this one uh, euro in per kilogram of, of hydrogen. Thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Marco. I don't think you can be called electrolyzer if you don't use electricity, but yeah. it's, it's a fair play. I think this is a very interesting approach as well. So thank you very much for your presentation. You're welcome. Um, and we go through the last presentation of today, which is going to be from Nora Castaneda. So Nora, if you want to share your screen and we're going to have question, time for just a couple of questions uh, at the very end. So. I'll just ask you after, guys. If you, there is any question, there's a question that is open there. Um, if anyone can answer it, that'll be great. And then we will we'll bring up a couple of... Nora, do you want to share your screen? You ready? I'm saying it, isn't it? No, not at the moment. We can't okay. see it. Okay. I can work you through it. 
Uh, okay, I didn't, uh, yeah. No, yes. Can you see? Yes, perfect. Yes. Go right ahead. I can hear you, I can see it, go right ahead. Okay, great, thank you. So we have already spoken a lot about uh, electrolyzer for some cons, cons of the different technologies and these more innovative solutions. So I will try to add ideas on what else we can do to optimize the levelized cost of hydrogen. Um, during the last few years, uh, hydrogen has jumped to the front line in the industry of decarbonization in order to achieve the different environmental agreements. And looking to the ambition, for instance, of Europe in the installation of 40 gigawatts of green hydrogen by 2030, our opinion is that uh, close communication between engineering companies and OEMs will be crucial to reach this goal. Considering its level of maturity, we have already said uh, Alkaline and PEM will be the governing technologies for big scale projects, at least for the near future. Um, even though there are other less mature technologies uh, who could beat in the medium term the Alkaline and PEM technology if they get to a sufficient degree of maturity, uh, are we talking of these big scale projects? Because we have already listened to an after, for instance, uh, that for other applications, uh, there are already uh, commercial products in other technologies. Um, I have to say that in general, both all technologies are working a lot on R&D activities, uh, focusing four main items, efficiency, carbon density, durability, and total investment. Um, these four items are related to each other and usually an improvement in one of the aspects causes a negative impact in the other. So a lot of work is being done to get a good balance of them and improve the stack KPIs. Um, however, the optimization of the BOP is also essential, we think, and it, it is important to work on that also to optimize the big scale plants. So the BOP or the balance of, of stack includes all the different items required for the proper operation of the stack from the gas liquid separator to the cooling medium or downstream compression. And it has not been analyzed in the same amount of detail compared with the stack. And this is the area where engineering companies can play a key role in the reduction of the levelized cost of hydrogen, in our opinion. Providing our experience in the integration, modernization, and construction of the different buildings block required not only for the hydrogen production, but also for transportation, storage, and final use of the hydrogen. So, the main challenge we see in the design of these large-scale uh, plants um, could be summarized as, as follows. First of all, the balance between centralized design versus decentralized. We have already spoken about modularization of the stacks, the size of the stack, which is something which needs to be considered. But nowadays, most of the skit available in the market present a common denominator. The gas-water separator are provided per module. A first action will be to evaluate the centralization of these and other items that are common per electrolyzer in order to minimize the capex. However, it is true that the, the, the decentralization should be also evaluated in terms of reliability, availability, and turndown. And the design needs to be flexible and reliable, reliable to cope with uh, green energy, energy variable profiles. A second action will be to reduce the waste streams. We have uh, Listen how the previous uh, uh, um, how Marco was talking about the the use of the the energy generated. Sorry, not Marco. It was Ignacio. A global optimization, optimization and utilization of the different uh, energy streams will lead to a reduction of the level cost of hydrogen as well. And it is well known that uh, large pro, a large proportion of the power supply to the electrolyzer is converted into waste heat. So we need to think how to reutilize it. Also, the way the plant is connected to the power supply plays a key role in the design of the system. Uh, we have plenty of experience of electrolyzer connected to the grid, uh, which could be considered a reliable or constant source of power, and which allows to, uh, to have a gradual capacity of control and less need of storage, uh, which could act as buffer. However, now what we want is to connect the electrolyzers to a green energy profile, which presents a large capacity, capacity fluctuations, and which affect not only to the turn down of the electrolyzer, but also, also to the other equipments and components which are uh, installed in the, in the generation plant. Uh, 
the brain generation plan. Um, finally, uh, alkaline and PEM requires, well, um, electrolysers in general requires DC voltage and current for their operation, high current indeed. So large current rectifiers are needed. And well, this type of equipments also are facing several challenges in, related to the power quality, energy efficiency, control and reliability, and which need to work also on the most appropriate solution on this field. Um, two last things for us. One is uh, standards. We are coming from an oil and gas sector with, uh, st with the standards. Well, the standards were prepared thinking about hydrocarbon, not about hydrogen only. So safety considerations and the standard for the hydrogen uh, application need to be reviewed and adapted to the specific risk and optimize, if possible, materials use and these aspects. And finally, legislation. We always talk about the legislation, but it is true. For instance, in Europe, uh, is, uh, Europe is still setting the guidelines and definitions for hydrogen, for green hydrogen. And this plays a major role in the way the plant is operated and consequently in the way the plant shall be designed. So it will affect to all the systems, the stacks and all the rest of systems. Therefore, in addition to working on the electrolyzers improvement, all these aspects need to be considered and might even impose some requirements on the electrolyzer equipment, which need to be considered between the engineering, the OEMs and the final users. Um, we are providing services to our clients to help them to define and optimize the projects, but also we are working on the development of technology, our future implementation of manufacturing capabilities through the APCA project that we have been awarded recently. And our project includes two lines of work, one looking more for the first wave of projects, um, focusing on the global optimization of the hydrogen generation plant based on alkaline technology in this case. So all the aspects I've been talking about. And the second one was looking for a new technology, nickel electrolyzer technology. In this case, we have focused on the AEM technology. We have spoken before about it. We see it like an evolution of the alkaline technology because of the reactions that you have been in place, but also uh, moving into the concept of the PEM technology. So it can join the advantages of the PEM electrolysis, uh, having compact design and more dynamic behavior, while having or keeping the advantages of the alkaline technology with low cost material. The actual limitation is the lifetime of the anion exchange membrane. Um, there is a lot of R&D being done around this, and we are already working on, on it. Also. And just to finish, in addition to work to, to, to being work to, to working, sorry, on electrolyzers, we are also working on other processes to generate hydrogen. We should uh, be able to create all the hydrogen uh, uh, value chain uh, from generation to final use. And this implies working also on ways of transporting hydrogen, reconverting or getting back the hydrogen, and also uh, helping the final users to be able to incorporate hydrogen in their processes. And for this, we are participating with uh, some other companies in some consortiums trying to move in this direction. So, thank you. Thank you very much. No, this, these are European projects, correct? So Horizon, yes. Horizon projects. Yes. And yes. H2 no. Glass, can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's a, well, it's an European uh, project. Uh, um, Later by the Synthet. And the objective of, this, of the project is to test the um, inclusion of hydrogen in five uh, glass manufacturing uh, companies in Europe, okay. in different countries. Uh, we are helping to define the hydrogen generation plant, which will move from one industry to the, to, to the other ones, to the five uh, um, industries in which we are testing it. And each of the companies wants to test the, uh, with different levels of uh, percentage at different conditions, but how the hydrogen or the, the mix, blending. the hydrogen. The blending, yeah. Really okay, the hydrogen, blending. yeah. Yeah, exactly. How interesting. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that project and your results. I can't okay, um, with them. 
<laughs> this is this is a long time going. I'm sure that you guys are just yeah. starting, but yeah. we, we will at some point have those results. So thank you very much to all of you for your, your presentations. I just have about one question for each of you as we are a little bit tight for time. So the first question I'd like to ask is for Mokun. Um, can you tell me about your work or the work that the consortium is doing uh, on advanced membranes? Yeah, you guys are, so yeah. I, mean, I have time to touch on that. So one of the things with the expansion of h 2 new, we are looking at gas recombination catalysts. So one of the things that is really important to FEM electrolysis is its ability to load follow. So in order to do that, you want to minimize the crossover. So I think if you minimize crossover, then you can go to much lower loads without a safety problem of too much hydrogen in the oxygen. And also it can improve the efficiency of the hydrogen production. So we're looking at materials with gas recombination catalysts inside that can avoid the uh, crossover hydrogen on the oxygen side, while also keeping the membrane thin enough so that you can get high performance. And we're looking at some, uh, there are some funded projects by DOE, for example, Kmors has a project. So we have their materials, we're looking at that. And we're also looking at the durability of what happens if you put these gas recombination catalysts, what happens over long periods of time, whether they're, how effective they are over time. So we are doing some of that research. And the other thing we're doing is looking at the mechanical durability of these membranes while doing pressure cycling. So that is something, especially if you do a lot of turn downs and on, on and off, then the membrane could have durability issues. We are examining that as part of our project. Thank you very much, um, Mukund. And also one of the issues I wanted to ask you, there was a lot of talk about iridium uh, earlier, you know, in the conversation also during the PEM discussions. Are you doing work on minimizing that, reusing, or what kind of work are you doing? Because you mentioned the rhythm a lot at the beginning. Yeah, so we're looking at the durability. So the current systems in the field have close to two milligram per centimeter squared of iridium. So uh, again, the Johnson Matthew report that we talked about in the previous panelists, so one of them is essentially trying to thrift the amount of iridium. So one of the things that they talk about is 50% reduction in the short term and 80% reduction in the long run. So within our consortium, the reason they use two milligram is the problems that I talked about, the iridium does dissolve, but if you start off with two milligrams, you have excellent durability over the lifetime. But if you start off with say 0.4 milligrams, which is quite a bit thrifting, which is what h 2 is after right now, then when you lose iridium from that, you start seeing performance hits over even short periods of time. Ideally, the DOE's ultimate target is just using 0.125 milligram per centimeter squared of iridium. So this is comparable to the, uh, the ORR catalyst platinum used in uh, PEM, so uh, fuel cells. So if we can decrease the amount of iridium to really low levels, understand durability and keep it stable, then I think the iridium supply should be more than enough to match electrolysis. But if you cannot do it, uh, if you continue to put two milligram iridium per centimeter squared, you're going to have trouble with this technology with the gigawatt and hundreds of gigawatt scale. But if you can get it down to those lower loadings, which is what we are examining, even at those low loadings, the performance is still really good, but the key is trying to get the durability over long periods of time. So that's one of our focus in this H2 new consortium. Thank you very much, Mukund. Yeah, we'll be looking really closely what you guys are doing because the DOE is obviously doing like a lot of work on this electrolyzer program. So thank you very much for clarifying. Now, question for Marco and for Ignacio is going to be the same. It's about, you guys have new technologies that you're kind of like uh, leading now. What is your commercialized, commercialization window? So when do you want to have the project be commercial by? And how are you going to manage the making sure that you're competitive by the time that you are commercial, you know, because obviously the costs are going to go down, you know, Nell, Senera, amongst other companies are going to give you a run for their money, for your money. And I ask that you you answer this shortly, please. <laughs> Ignacio or Marco, I don't mind who starts. Ignacio, please. Okay. okay. Uh, so um, I, I mentioned I had a slide right on, on the pilot, uh, the 0 0.4 megawatt pilot running later this year. Uh, we are already in, in uh, the process of, of designing and expecting data from the pilot, but to deliver 12 megawatt systems in 2024, at some point in 2024, and, and then 25 megawatt systems in 2025, and, and then into hundreds uh, 
So it will be a few of those systems in, in the next couple of years and then uh, into the hundreds of megawatts beyond that. Uh, so, uh, and, and in terms of the, the second part of the question, so we have inherently an, an advantage in that the higher efficiency means uh, a lot, uh, no, no waste heat to remove. So we, we don't have all of that heat removal equipment. Um, and we're, of course, working hard in, in being competitive. Our anode is, is that nickel hydroxide uh, on a nickel substrate, as I explained. So we don't have iridium or platinum to worry about in, in the anode. Um, so I, I think we're going to be very competitive. Marco, did you want to venture really quickly to answer? Yeah. In our case, uh, we, uh, we will install the first pilot plan in uh, 2025. Uh, the process of the production process for the catalyst that we are using is already industrial one, is one of the key points of Haisan, is that the catalyst is very easy to produce. We don't use also iridium or any other complicated material. We just use therion and copper uh, or silver, and this is uh, very easy to industrialize for us. And uh, we want to be in 2026 with enough operation time of this pilot plan to be in a commercial phase. The new component that really is not in the market because of all of the other components that we use as the content, solar concentrators, all, all of these components are already assist in the market. And the new uh, component is the uh, reactor, this multi-tubular reactor. And we are working now with the industrialization of this reactor for a capability of uh, 8,000, 80,000 tubes per, per year in the next, in the next uh, years. So. Okay, thank you very much. And just a final question, and this is for Sergio and for Nora. And it's about what are your cost reduction targets, say in the next three to five years? You know, when you're looking at designing systems, preparing for the systems of the future, what are you looking at in terms of the target for, for the cost reductions or the cost um, competitive, competitiveness that you want to have in your systems? I can start first. Um, so depending on our platform, that, uh, that varies, but... Um, for PEM, our cost reduction is estimated to uh, go down by 70% and for our client for, by 40%. That's amazing. Is in three to five years? Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Sergio, for going that to the And Nora, what about you? Are you quite so ambitious? Sorry, we cannot hear you. Just can you put the... I was saying that uh, now we have not uh, fixed that ambitious figures. Um, our objective was to fulfill the KPIs that uh, on one hand, they are published in Europe, and on another hand, we are checking with the clients what do they need in order to be able to uh, execute the big scale projects that they have in their pipelines. Um, and well, this is the, the objective. On one hand, we will need to understand which is the the objectives that the OEM has uh, in relation with the stacks and, and combine themselves with the rest of the plan. But yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Sergio and Mukund and Marco and Nora and Ignacio for sharing with us. It's been really interesting to hear about all your different uh, technology in the R&D. I mean, we're nothing without R&D. You know, the future depends on all of the work that you're doing now. So thank you very much. I'm going to let, actually, Mukund, you just finished answering that question. That Excellent. So now, very quickly, we're going to say goodbye to you guys, and we're going to welcome the last speaker of today, who is going to be uh, with me just chatting a lot about bankability and business models. What happens when uh, you are actually have your technology, you have your electrolyzer, you have your projects, but then you need money for it, and then... You have to go and get investors in. You have to go and convince the bank to invest in your technology and your project. What happens at that point? How are electrolyzers being considered into that equation um, at the moment? Is it an issue if you choose different manufacturers? This is kind of the, the kind of things that we're going to be discussing very shortly with, with Shalini, who is the speaker. And at this point, my colleagues are just simply uh, putting her on. And I can see that she's already come in. So it's just she switches on her camera and her microphone. And what I would say is, I 
think this is going to be a 15 minutes or so session, so it's not going to be much, much longer. And hopefully you'll get your, your answers about bankability. I think in this other session, we were able to answer all your questions. If you have any, send them through and we'll try our best as well. So hi, Shalini, how are you? Good, how are you, Belen? Very well, welcome. I, I, I love having you in, in, in our webinars. I like working with Shalini because she's straight to the point. She has a very clear mind. She puts things across. And also, she's my second woman in this panel. <laughs> so we're pretty lonely here, Shalini. So we need to get more women in the industry, Belen. Indeed. So all of the women that are in the audience, please get in touch. Let's get you, you know, on the speaking side. So why don't you introduce yourself and give us a little bit of your experience and you know, kind of proposition in terms of bankability business models. We're focusing on electrolysis a little bit in this session. We have prepared some questions, so don't worry, guys. But we're expecting yours as well in the audience. So if you start, Shalini, then I'll take it from there. Perfect. Um, of course, uh, my name is Shalini Ramanathan. I'm director with Quinbrook Infrastructure Partners. We're a specialist fund. We focus on the clean energy transition and we've invested in multiple technologies, wind, solar, energy storage, green data centers, and we're currently evaluating a number of investments in the green fuel space, including green hydrogen. So I've certainly thought a lot about the question of bankability. Thank you very much, Salini. Let's start with, um, in terms of deal flow, I mean, we hear a lot of news, uh, you know, and you, you cannot go one day without reading some massive announcement. But, you know, the bottlenecks, the manufacturing capacity, and so on and so forth. And I suppose the off-takers, you know, which is the biggest bottleneck, are what they are. So what kind of sort of real deal flow are you seeing at the moment is specifically in electrolytic hydrogen? And what are the timelines that you're seeing usually like? Like that, I mean, by when do people are aiming to produce uh, hydrogen? Yeah, this is a great time um, to be having this discussion because I think we've all had several months of the to absorb the reality um, of the Inflation Reduction Act here in the U.S. and to really think through how that um, how those incentives are going to play out. Um, the deal flow that we're seeing is there are a number of large projects uh, in the U.S. that have been announced or have been brought brought to us and to other investors, I'm sure, that are really targeting the export market, you know, addressing the energy crisis in Europe. And I think there's a broad sense that that is, um, you know, a very promising application for green hydrogen and one that frankly, is also uh, supported by the manufacturers of blue hydrogen, the oil and gas industry. And blue hydrogen, of course, is hydrogen, uh, you know, SMR uh, made with natural gas, but then with carbon capture. And because of that oil and gas support, I think that the export market is really interesting and it's something that we're tracking very closely. But I think everyone involved understands, you know, these are massive projects, right? So it's going to take a long time to happen. You know, you might need new equipment on, on both sides, you know, um, certainly new terminals, new ships. And so for, for those reasons, I think that's a longer term play. So in terms of near term, we're seeing some projects in the heavy duty transport space. And that is new just because the trucks that can use green hydrogen are, are themselves new. They're, they're, you know, they're still, they're being manufactured, uh, you know, and they're just now, um, you know, being sent to customers as part of uh, new products. And so that is, we're seeing some exciting projects and, and we're, um, and we're very interested to see how the market develops, but that's, that's new. There aren't currently a lot of, you know, a lot of vehicles on the road that, that can, that can use green hydrogen. And then finally, we're seeing um, some projects and some developers that have that are really targeting existing customers, um, existing users of gray hydrogen and trying to convert them to green. And the advantage of that, of course, is that you don't need new equipment. You're not, you know, waiting on um, waiting on any kind of um, new cars or anything to be developed. And the challenge of that is, well, there's an, there's a product, there's gray hydrogen, and many customers may be happy with that. And so uh, it's been interesting to, to talk to de hydrogen developers, green hydrogen project developers who've had some success in, you know, converting industrial users to, to, the, to the green product. It must be a really hopeful time as well, seeing all these really great projects going across your desk. Um, okay, so what kind of business models uh, are you coming across uh, in your work with hydrogen or more specifically electrolytic or renewable hydrogen? 
Yeah, so in the context of electrolytic hydrogen, we're seeing a couple of business models that, that I think are, are worth discussing. The first is a more integrated business model where you have a large independent power producer who owns multiple wind and solar projects. And you know, they're able to put electrolyzers um, you know, on, on their existing projects or on their new projects. And the advantage of that, of course, is that they control the source of the green power. And of course, you can't have green electrons without, we can't have green hydrogen without green electrons. So that green power is really critical. So that integrated model is interesting. I was just listening into the previous panel. It was fascinating about R&D. And I'm really curious to see if we'll see more OEMs that are vertically integrated, um, that, you know, that are really um, looking at you know, in addition to supplying um, electrolyzers, maybe also selling green hydrogen or, you know, maybe even getting into green power to ensure that the that they have access to that to make green hydrogen. I think that the biggest differentiation we're seeing in terms of business models um, is are those developers who plan to own long term and those who um, plan to develop projects and and you know and sell them on to others um, who you know whose cost of capital and expertise is better set up for ownership. So it's a fascinating time because the market's evolving very very um, quickly. Thank you very much, Shalini. That's really interesting. So it's a bit like like renewable projects themselves, right? Some people kind of like there for the long term. Some people are going to sell them once they start producing hydrogen, or maybe a little bit before once they're wrapped. Uh, which makes perfect sense actually because you know companies uh skill sets and strengths lie in different places and with the exception of securing an off taker which is incredibly difficult i think this is the case for the us and europe um what are the biggest challenges right now for hydrogen project developers looking to wrap their projects financially yeah, so we, it sounds like, you know, the, the offtake is something that, you know, uh, has come up, right? So we all know that getting, getting offtake is very important. And one thing I'll add, you know, to the offtake discussion is that, you know, credit is incredibly important. Um, you know, you don't just need offtake, you need offtake from a credit worthy entity. And that's something we, I think that the, the growth of the solar and wind industry in the US, is really based on that, you know, is based on having credit worthy offtakers on the other side of the deals. Um, so I hope that everyone who's working on projects is focusing on that. Um, in addition, I think the terms that, you know, we, we heard from on the previous panel and before that right now, alkaline and PEM electrolyzers are, um, you know, are very, um, are, are bankable. They're, you know, they're the very mature technologies. And I think, um, I think if you're working within with those OEMs that are producing those that are supplying you with those electrolyzers, I think it's really important to look at the contract terms very carefully and make sure that you're getting, you know, I think we're trying to figure out how long a warranty term do you need to have? You know, what happens if the performance isn't as good as predicted? You know, they're just a, you know, what is the stack replacement? Is there a shared expectation around that? So I think we're, I think getting all of those details right is incredibly important. And there's another one uh, that I think is really worth touching on. I, I know that there's been a lot of focus today in this discussion around electrolyzers. Um, in the US, which is the market that I've been focused on, the cost of green power is 80% of the cost of these projects. I used to say it was 60% and now it's been, it's been steadily creeping up. And the reason for that is because the cost of green power has been increasing in the US, um, So, which is great. If you, are, um, if you are a solar project or a wind project or a developer in, you know, in, in those spaces, the fact that prices are going up is, you know, is good, um, assuming you have sorted out your supply chain and can deliver. Um, but I think if you're, if the, it's, it's challenging for green hydrogen because let's say that you, you have crossed the offtake bridge, you, you have an offtaker and you, uh, and you now, you know, are, you know, you're trying to get your project done. I think there's a question around, but you don't control a solar or wind project. Do you sign a power purchase agreement right now? Do you wait for prices to go down? Do you assume you can, you know, buy on the merchant market? Do you assume that you can just, you know, use grid power and buy RECs, um, which of course would be, you know, a, a less expensive solution than having behind the meter solar. So I think there are a lot of issues that go into bankability. And I think a, a big one is how confident um, is it, you know, how confident can an investor be that the source of low cost green power matches up with the, you know, the life cycle of the project. You, you don't want to have a power purchase agreement that runs out in year five and you have, you know, seven years of obligation to fulfill under offtake. 
So may I ask, how do you feel about this when the you know the the projects come across your desk? This is a question that I wanted to ask. Are you saying oh, this is an issue like water? You know, I have to be careful with this. Do you think it'll work out? You know, I we are in the business of making strategic bets and educated bets. So you know, these are just risk factors that we you know we we live with all the time. Thank you very much. Uh, you have answered with our answer. It's awesome because <laughs> you haven't really told me like ah, it's going to go up, it's going to go down. But I, I I get that at the end, it is like anything really. I think overall there is going to be more renewable rather than less in time. Whether the, the price margins will stay up or not, we will see, I suppose, with time. Um, I think it's likely that we're going to be seeing a lot of mergers and acquisitions and electrolyzers in the next few years. Um, and probably there's going to be heavy consolidation. This is just going by previous you know, experience in other industries. So this could mean a little bit of a risk in terms of warranties running out or companies not being there to being able to back them up um, in a few years. And so how are the financial risks related to the choice of electrolyzer and how can you mitigate those or how do you consider those in, you know, in the projects that you come across at the moment? You just have to negotiate those deals very carefully. And it's challenging right now because um, at least in this period, there is a shortage of electrolyzers. <laughs> so, you know, like it, it, at the same time, though, you have to really get those terms right and make sure that, um, you know, just remember that, like, you know, if, if, a, if a contract isn't bankable, then you may have to go back. And so I think it's worth taking the time um, and even maybe, you know, calling um, finance parties and asking them, you know, are, are these terms um, going to work for them? So I, I think the negotiation with the OEMs and the EPCs um, and, you know, this, we haven't talked about a lot about this, but, you know, it's, it's not like there are a lot of EPCs that have experience with electrolytic hydrogen. It's a new industry. And so I think we're working toward an under, a shared understanding of, you know, what is, what is standard, what is acceptable. Are there issues right now around electrolysis or technical risks um, that you consider in your, you know, in your, in your, investments essentially or is it just a matter of what's the company what warranties what technology is there anything how much of a technology that is this essentially in terms of so this key component one one thing that is a, a question we talk about all the time um, at our company and i'm sure um, in the industry it's a broader discussion is you never want to lock into outdated technologies we just heard a fascinating panel on r d and you know um, new developments that could really change, you know, bend the cost curve. And so I think there's an interesting question of, and it, it's not so, it's similar to solar. I think it's more complicated here because you have truly just new technologies and not just, you know, um, not just improvements, process improvements. But I think a question of how far out you go with your procurement, given all the things that are changing um, in this, you know, in this market is a big one. And, uh, and I also think that the balance sheet of OEMs and, you know, what can they really back? And you know how how many projects are they doing, and what is the total liability? Um, you know of the commitments they're making. All of these are very important factors. So it's nice to see some of the big names that we're speaking today, <laughs> who, who can you know who can tick those boxes, right? Yeah, I mean some of the ones before uh, that we're talking about um, technology specifically. When I asked about warranties, some of them said, "Oh, one year plus one." You know, like the, the actual warranties could pretty low and they said that they expect in the next few years to go to industry standards which I take to mean you know like the 15 years or so that you get or for batteries for for panels but like one two years you know five years is not a lot this is why how do you manage or mitigate this risk around these warranties and who who can give you a good warranty who is like a little bit more iffy because we know that there is such a bottleneck that at the moment is so difficult to procure you know this key component that sometimes you just have to make compromises. It's true. It's a very challenging time. And I think that one of the mitigating factors is, um, you know, if you have to place a bet like that, right, if you have to, to take on that risk um, with a, you know, with a, a warranty period that is less than what, you know, what you're used to, I think it's better to do it with smaller projects rather than larger ones, you know. Um, so I think that, I think the industry, we're working our way up to these larger projects. And, and I think, uh, I hope that a lot of these questions around what is industry standard, what is acceptable, I hope that'll be answered. Um, by the time we're, you know, we're all getting getting really going on the large export projects. 
or the large domestic projects. And uh, yes, my final question, but there is two from the audience that I'm going to sure. ask you as well. Uh, is there uh, know-how from other markets or perhaps other technologies that we can borrow uh, and, you know, or are we actually building everything anew? Because this is an old technology, so it does have, you know, some historical examples we can use, but really all of the technology that we're looking at is pretty new now. I think there's a lot to learn uh, from the oil and gas industry, because at the end of the day with hydrogen, we are talking about a molecule and not an electron. And so I think there's a lot to, to learn from the way that, um, that LNG has developed, uh, export of LNG has developed um, pipelines, right? Long-term, and this is not something that's gonna happen overnight, but I hope we do have purity pipelines in the US that can transport um, green hydrogen. And so, and, and obviously there are pipeline companies <laughs> that understand that far better than renewable developers do. So I'm excited by the convergence um, between the wh wh where I've worked for my career, the green power industry and, uh, and, and then the molecule industry. Thank you very much. So learning from oil and gas, I think this is a good thing, especially for the guys that are in renewables, you know, maybe we have a lot to learn in that regard for sure. You so always have, have a lot to learn. <laughs> no, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's fascinating. You know, there's always someone that has, has been through a lot of the challenges that we're having now. So there is a, two questions here. One from Bilenis. This says, hi, do you have an in-house models to assess bankability of green hydrogen projects or to procure, collaborate with third parties for this? Uh, which are your go-to, no-go-to gates for bankability? So I do not have a model and I have not seen one. I will say that some of the, the, the issues to consider are uh, the, similar as they are, honestly, for other offtake agreements. It's, you know, the credibility and the credit of the offtaker, the, you know, the, the revenue and how, um, how fixed that is. You know, it, one, one issue for bankability that we haven't talked about is contract tenors. You know, we're used, um, we're used to power purchase agreements for wind and solar in the U.S. being for 10 years, 12 years or longer, uh, 15 years in some cases. They used to be 20 years. And, you know, other, the molecule, if you're selling molecules, those industries may work differently depending on the molecule that you're selling. And so I think that the contract tenor is a key one to focus on and and, and, and it, it really is tied into, is the price fixed for that entire time? Is the price indexed to something else? If so, what is the exposure? Are you working with, uh, you know, an OEM provider that, you know, that has a balance sheet to back, back up the commitments? Um, how good are the warranty terms? How, what risk is the EPC taking? What risk is the project wearing? So it's a lot of stuff we've covered. So I, it's not a written checklist, but you know, I hope that helps. So, but once again, like first we go to the offtake, right? Because this is the big one. It's like, how much can I trust that these guys are going to be there for however long? So I think the, the first point of contact for all developers is first get your offtaker, for sure. I just want to add, I don't, I don't know it'll, I don't think it'll be that way forever um, because I, I hope that the, if we're going to have a hydrogen economy, which is what we're all working toward. I hope it moves toward um, short-term sales and a liquid market where hydrogen is, you know, green hydrogen is sold and traded. But I think for these initial projects, the first, first, maybe second wave of projects offtake is, is important. No, completely, I completely agree. Yeah. And once there is a market, you know, it's a commodity essentially. So you already know, we know what the prices are going to be like, but whilst it's not a commodity, then you got to think and you got to figure out, you know, who's going to buy that from you. Thank you, Shalini. <laughs> and last questions from Miva. It says, thank you for the great session. Thank you, Miva. And uh, my question for Shalini is, uh, what is the perspective on export projects under the IRA? For now, the word seems slightly blurry, but in light of the interest on the US developers to support the molecule, is this a space that will ramp up in a few years? Thank you. It's in line with it, what we were discussing just now. It's a great question. I will say that there are a number of very serious developers that are working on large export projects. And a lot of everyone, all of us are waiting. We're waiting for the guidance from the, uh, from the US government on exactly how, what a project has to do to qualify for the full hydrogen production tax credit. And one of the complications of export is that you earn that in the US, that, you know, the tax credit in the US, but then if you're exporting to Europe or to Asia, you have to meet the standards in other markets. 
And it's really clear that we're not moving toward a global standard for what makes hydrogen green. You know, every every uh, re part of every region of the world seems to have its own answer, have its own answer to that. And that is a it's it's not going to stop us. We'll figure out a solution. But right now, the lack of uniformity of a uniform standard is definitely uh, a challenge. Thank you, Shalini. Just one last question for you before we say goodbye. And uh, you know, and I thank you. Uh, is uh, what kind of deals? Would you like to invest? Because I know you have a lot of money we've spent in the past investing this. You and all of the other people that are looking, they're looking to put the money elsewhere in good projects. And perhaps those are not as forthcoming as one would have thought. So what are you looking for? Someone in the audience has this, I'll buy what kind of thing is it that makes that yeah. project perfect? So our, our target geographies are the US, the UK, and Australia. And so that limits uh, some of what we can do. Um, I, I previously in, in a past life worked in other parts of the world, and I think it's really exciting that green hydrogen is happening everywhere. But Quinbrook's target geographies are those three countries. You know, we don't think that offtake has to be signed today, but we like projects and we like uh, developers who, who have a, an offtake strategy, who talk to customers and have a sense of what they need to do to actually have a signed contract. And then the basics of which we haven't touched on very much in this call, but you know, do you have land control? How good are your water rights? Um, can you get the project to market? You know, um, if if you're if a developer is working on a project, but they're hoping that someone else is going to build a pipeline to get that to market, you know, that that may or may not happen. But a project that can deliver to a customer very very quickly um, is certainly something that um, that you know that we'd love to look at. But you know, we we like working with you know smart teams and um, people who really have a um, you know have who have a serious approach to the industry and, and who can solve a lot of these problems. Thank you very much, Shalini, for being here today and answering our questions on bankability. Uh, and thank you also to everyone who is in the audience, you know, and you've actually stayed on till the end. You know, um, someone here was saying that three hours blew, uh, flew by and we're glad to see, you know, that people, there was a lot of learning here. Do you also have names now and surnames of people who are working on this, who are experts on this? So if you have a good project, you can reach out to Shalini and I'm sure that she'll love to work with you or to hear from you and for all of the other sessions as well. So thank you very much for uh, attending today. Uh, we'll see you in the next webinars, but also if you're up for it, we'll see you in uh, Roma de USA in Las Vegas, hopefully, and we'll see you there too, Shalini. And without further ado, thank you very much and see you next time.